All right, I will call this meeting of the Senate Judiciary to order. Will the secretary please take the roll? Senator Harris, Senator Orenshaw, Senator Dondero Loop, Senator Wynn, Senator Hansen, Here. Senator Krasner, Here. Senator Stone, Chair Scheibel. Here, please mark those senators present who are not yet here when they arrive. Um, welcome everybody to a noon session of Senate Judiciary Committee. We have a full workload today with four um, bill hearings and a work session. Uh, just to give you kind of a, a lay of the land, my plan plan is to hear SB 379 first, um, then try to fit in the work session before we go to SB 296, then SB 307, then SB 416. As always this time of year, that is subject to change based on presenter availability as well as having all of my committee here to do the work session. Um, in case any of you are new to this process, you will see members of the committee uh, coming in late, leaving early, coming back and forth. That is because they are presenting bills or doing work sessions or other important work in other committees. So please know that um, Please don't take this as a sign of disrespect. Likewise, um, even more than usual, we'll be looking at our, our laptops and maybe even our phones to make sure that we're all looking at the same amendments or following up with you know stakeholders who reached out to us about these bills because we wanna make sure that we give them a fair and thorough hearing. And so uh, with all of that being said, I am happy to welcome Senator Don Darrow Loop to the front of the room and open up the hearing on SB 379. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and committee members. This is the first time I've been able to present in front of you, so this is kind of a good thing. Thank you very much. I am Marilyn Dondero Loop. I am representing District 8 in Las Vegas in uh, Clark County, the gaming capital of the world, of course. And today I'm here to present Senate Bill 379 for your consideration, a bill that provides for the licensure and regulation of secondary sports pool wedger wagering brokers. Sports betting has been growing exponentially over the last several years, which is fantastic for our gaming industry and thus our state. Have, however, as is always true, when innovation comes for Nevada to remain the gold standard of the industry, we must ensure that our regulatory framework not only keeps pace, but also sets the standard for other jurisdictions to meet. This is what Senate Bill 379 is designed to do in the secondary sports betting arena. I am pleased to have uh, sponsored this bill, but I have with me today the Boyd School of Law Gaming Law and Policy Group to actually discuss the technical elements of the bill and answer your questions as this is a bill that comes from their endeavors. There are three concepts re contained within the bill. They are a new definition for game, the gaming employee, restructuring of foreign gaming reporting, and a registration process for secondary ticket brokers. So I am going to quickly go over uh, section two of the bill and then I'm gonna call up the uh, law school students and allow them to introduce themselves and give you some more information. Section two defines a secondary sports wagering pool bro broker as a person who for a fee facilitates the sale for one person of another of an existing wager originally placed with a person who owns a sports pool. Section 3 then requires the Nevada Gaming Commission to adopt regulations governing these brokers, including requiring that they be registered with the Nevada Gaming Control Board and that their employees also be registered in the same manner as other gaming employees. This section also requires the Commission establish the fee structure for these registrations. Other sections of the bill make it illegal to operate one of these businesses without proper registration, require the adoption of regulations specifying duties relating to the manufacture and repair of any equipment or interactive gaming systems used in the business, and finally, provide for quarterly and annual reporting on various subjects related to foreign gaming manufacturers, which is defined to mean a business that receives revenue from gaming devices that are located outside the state of Nevada. This is a short cliff note of the bill, uh, Chair Scheibel. So um, because uh, I am carrying this for the law school students, I'm going to step back and allow them to take over. Thank you.
Oh, you have to turn on your microphone. Rookie mistake. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, Vice Chair Harris, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Doug Billings, B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S. Uh, and I will be discussing, we're actually going to start at the end of the bill today, I will be discussing Section 7 of SB 379, which proposes to, ch to make changes to Nevada's foreign gaming statutes. Uh, the intent of Section 7 is to modernize the statute that has really outgrown its original purpose and to align it, the statute with the modern way that the Gaming Control Board practices in this, in this respect. Uh, a bit of history, the foreign gaming reports, reporting statutes were first adopted in in 1977 after the state of New Jersey first implemented legalized gambling and there was a concern at the time among Nevada regulators that a Nevada licensee might go into New Jersey or another jurisdiction begin to operate have problems and that would that would have some negative impact on the state of Nevada and its reputation so uh, in response to that the legislature passed and adopted the foreign gaming statutes which initially required a Nevada licensee to obtain permission from the Gaming Commission before they could operate foreign gaming. Uh, in 1993, the legislature, the legislature amended the statute, uh, did away with the permission structure, and instead replaced it with a robust reporting requirement. Uh, under the revised statute, licensees participating in foreign gaming uh, were required to file various annual and quarterly reports, as well as reports each time they, they left or came into a new jurisdiction. Uh, the reporting requirements were and are set forth in NRS 463.710. Uh, despite the rapid expansion of gaming uh, across the globe in the last 30 years, and the fact, and despite the fact that multi-jurisdictional gaming companies are now commonplace uh, throughout the industry, the statute and the requirements contained in there in largely remain the same as they were in 1993. Uh, as a result, compliance for the industry has become more and more burdensome as has the collection of data on, on the part of the board, of the Gaming Control Board. Uh, it's worth noting the, the law applies equally to all licensees, whether those are operators of casinos or slot machine manufacturers. And when we first began to look at this bill, we really focused on the manufacturers who have some unique issues uh, because they have, it's particularly a burden for them. They are in thousands of locations, as you can imagine. They have slot machines throughout the world uh, operating in hundreds of jurisdictions and thousands of locations. So the reporting requirements uh, were particularly burdensome for that for manufacturers. Uh, we submitted a BDR that resulted in SB 379. Uh, Section 7 of SB 379 in the current form makes a distinction between manufacturers and operators with different reporting requirements for each group. However, as we reached out uh, to stakeholders over the past few weeks, including, uh, importantly, the Gaming Control Board, uh, we learned some things. We learned there was a broad agreement among, uh, among the stakeholders that the statute needed to be modernized, and we learned there was a shared appetite to expand the scope of Section 7 to include not only manufacturers, but operators too. Uh, to that end, I have been collaborating with the Gaming Control Board's Investigations Division over the past few weeks to understand their wants and needs with respect to foreign gaming, and that has resulted in the conceptual amendment that you should have in front of you. Uh, and let me turn to the conceptual amend amendment and quickly explain what it does and the intention behind it. Uh, first, I'd note it entire, entirely replaces Section 7 of SB 379. Uh, second, it removes the distinction I just talked about between operators and manufacturers. Uh, instead, it would, it, we will continue to have, if this bill were to pass, one set of reporting requirements that would continue to apply to all licensees. However, those reporting requirements would be substantially reduced and simplified for all licensees. Uh, effectively, there would be three requirements. And if you look at the conceptual amendment, uh, under what would be NRS 473.7101, uh, basically there would be a requirement that any Nevada licensee uh, file a notice when they begin participating in foreign gaming. Under 473.7103, there would be a requirement they file a notice if they exit gaming. Now, I do want to note, uh, I think it's even broader, the, the conceptual amendment, as I continue to discuss with the board uh, and the investigations division, I think this is even still too broad, probably, uh, and perhaps I did an inartful job in drafting it. The intent is to have a single notice filed when a licensee begins or ends foreign gaming. Uh, rather than a notice each time it enters or exits a new jurisdiction. So hopefully that's something that we, that we can continue to improve as, if and when this bill moves forward. Uh, returning to the bill, the third requirement that would be placed on, on uh, licensees is contained in 473.7102. Uh, that contains a number of specific uh, items regarding foreign gaming information 
uh, such as changes in ownership or management or regulatory fines imposed by a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, those are carryovers from the existing statute and are things that the Gaming Control Board wants and needs to continue to receive from their licensees. So among other things, this amendment would eliminate annual reports that are currently required uh, under the existing statute, and it would also eliminate quarterly reports where licensees have been required to identify every location in which they participate, which again uh, is, is, is somewhat of a burden on everyone, but in particular has been a burden on manufacturers. Uh, Cumulatively, these, change, these changes would result in significant reduction in the regulatory burden on licensees and would also reduce the amount of unnecessary paperwork coming into the Gaming Control Board. Uh, it would also continue to ensure the board has all of the foreign gaming information it requires to continue to monitor out-of-state business practices of its licensees. Uh, the gaming landscape is very different than it was in 1977 and even than it was in 1993. And while Nevada continues to be the gold standard when it comes to gaming regulation, other states and other countries have themselves developed robust regulatory systems that help to ensure the integrity of gaming worldwide. Uh, simply put, concerns that were present in, 1990, in 1977 and in 1993 simply do not exist anymore, and we believe the statute should be reflected to show that fact. Uh, for these reasons, I would ask your support of SB 379, including the conceptual amendment to Section 7, and with that, I will turn things over to Veronica and Denisova. Good afternoon, Chair Shelba, Vice Chair and members of committee. My name is Veronica Denisova, D-E-N-I-S-O-V-A. -E I'm LLM students in Boyd School of Law, UNLV. And I would like to thank um, for this opportunity to testify on, the, on this bill SB 379. I'm testifying on proposed change to the definition of gaming employee described in section NRS 463.0157. The main idea of my proposal is to consider employers whose duties are directly related to the manufacturer. The main point of registering gaming employer is to avoid unsuitable workers in gaming industry and to avoid violation of the law. Uh, by obligating to register gaming employees involved with manufacture of gaming devices, we do not <coughs> perform the main function, function of monitoring and regulating gaming activities, but we are engaged in paperwork in order to avoid punishment for non-compliance with the conditions for registering a gaming employee. Most employees in manufacture do not have direct access to affects the result of wager. Identifying the employees sh who should be registered as gaming employers directly involved in the production process is sometimes in very complicated. Uh, we are visiting one of the manufacturer of slot uh, machines and ask which of the employees are subject to register. And they said all employees are registered just in case, since we cannot determine which employees are under the definition of gaming employees and which do not. I propose that the Commission adopt a provision defining the responsibility associated with the manufacture or repair of gaming devices, related equipment, cashless betting system, systems or interactive gaming systems that an employer must have in order for the employer to be considered a gaming employee in accordance with paragraph G of subsection 1 and arrest 463.0157. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mike Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S, and I, alongside my colleague Jeff Ballers, are testifying and asking for your support for SB 379. The section Mr. Ballers and I worked on deals with secondary, secondary ticket brokers and provides for their regulation. Now, during the late 1990s and early 2000s, the internet revolutionized many industries. Among these were ticket brokers. Companies like StubHub, Ticketmaster, and others popped up creating a marketplace for the buying and reselling of purchased tickets. Now, when the United States Supreme Court 
repealed PASPA, it was no surprise that this model found its way in the sports world. Right now, Nevada law only contemplates secondary brokering as it relates to dubious or deceptive practices. So this primarily deals with scalping, but no other regulations exist as of yet. As we saw with the Taylor Swift ticket fiasco, regulation is appropriate and often needed in this area and in this context. Right now across the country, secondary ticket brokers are operating. In many jurisdictions, they're not considered gambling uh, enterprises, and states often do not have a position on whether or not they should be regulated. But Nevada, again, like my colleague said, being the gold standard, should lead the way and regulate this industry. Now, throughout this process and the drafting process, we've had an opportunity to reach out to stakeholders. And some of the feedback that support re uh, the registration of these ticket brokers um, includes anti-money anti laundering concerns and con uh, concerns the types of people that are actually placing these wagers. Um, again, self-imposed integrity standards in this industry uh, lead the way, but it's important to have these reflected in our re uh, regulations. So again, we ask for your support for 379, uh, which asks uh, for the commission to provide for the regulation uh, and operation of secondary ticket brokers uh, that uh, provide a marketplace for individuals to once they purchase a legal sports betting ticket to actually sell it to another person. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee. I'm Jeff Bowlers, it's B-O-L-L-E-R-S, also testifying in support of SB 379, and uh, we'd like to thank the committee for hearing our bill first this afternoon. I want to reiterate that the bill draft request that ultimately became SB 379 was original work produced in our capacities as students at the UNLV Boyd School of Law. And while each of us did reach out to stakeholders for feedback, uh, the language we ultimately submitted to the Legislative Council Bureau was the culmination of our own independent research and drafting on issues in which we had a personal interest and which we considered important to the gaming industry in Nevada. The secondary sports pool wagering broker component of SB 379 is important because the current statutory and regulatory scheme in Nevada does not contemplate the existence of a secondary market for sports wagers. The bill does not offer preferential treatment to secondary sports wager brokers. It's really asking for a recognition that this business is distinct from operating a sports book and therefore warrants a different kind of regulatory treatment. Secondary wager brokers don't pose and are not exposed to the same risks um, that sportsbook operators are. And the fundamental differences in the nature of the business warrant a different regulatory scheme. Trying to make sportsbook regulations applicable to sports wager brokers is impractical, if not largely inapplicable. Um, for example, regulations that concern maintaining cash reserves to pay winning wagers, uh, regulations concerning the posting of odds, they simply don't apply to sports wagering ticket brokers because that's not an aspect of their business. It would be something like trying to apply the same set of regulations to Priceline.com and United Airlines. It is true that you can purchase a plane ticket through either of those entities, but the fundamental differences in those businesses warrants a different kind of regulatory treatment. No one would accuse Priceline.com of operating an airline without a license simply because they facilitate the purchase of airline tickets. The registration requirements in SB 379 reflect and balance Nevada's public policy priorities of encouraging innovation through free market competition and maintaining integrity in the gaming industry by excluding bad actors. Requiring secondary wager brokers to register uh, and requiring their employees to register with the Gaming Control Board will deter unsuitable actors from attempting to enter the market. Section 3, subsections 4 and 5 of SB 379 empower the Commission to call forward the owner, operator, or employee of any secondary wager broker for a finding of suitability and to exclude any person the Commission deems unsuitable. 
Maintaining the status quo in Nevada and requiring secondary wager brokers to obtain a non-restricted gaming license will continue to operate as a de facto prohibition of these businesses. For businesses like these secondary brokers that generate revenue through transaction fees uh, rather than gaming activity and amenities, the cost of obtaining a non-restricted gaming license in Nevada is simply untenable. SB 379 does not allow secondary wager brokers to evade regulation. It provides for the appropriate type of regulation proportional to the nature and scope of their businesses. SB 379 also furthers Nevada's public policy by empowering regulators <clears throat> to exclude uh, persons it finds unsuitable um, and ultimately allowing the market to determine whether those persons uh, or those businesses are viable. We respectfully ask for the committee's support of SB 379 in its entirety, and we thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak during the committee hearing today. All right, I think that is, those are all of our presenters, and so I'm sure my committee has a few questions for you. Um, why don't you two stay here, and if your two co-presenters wanna come up and have one of them sit at the table and one of them pull up a chair or, or sit right behind you so that we can um, get our questions answered. So, who has a question? Just me? Just me, okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the definition of a gaming employee because I don't see where in the bill um, that <coughs> definition is being changed. We, we just pro provide to add the, to the commission adopt provision definition about responsibility in gaming employer. Okay, and can you state your name for the record, please? Uh, my name is Veronica. Denisova, D-E-N-I-S-O-V-A. So I'm can, sorry. That's okay. So can you point me to where in the bill that amendment would go? It's section four. The commission shall adopt regulation specifying the duties relating to the manufacture or repairing of gaming devices, associated equipment, cashless wagering system, or interactive gaming system that an employer must have for the for that employee to constitute a gaming employee pursuant to the to paragraph G of subsection one of NRS four sixty three point zero one fifty seven. Okay, I think I misunderstood that you were proposing an amendment that would add the definition to statute, but what you're proposing is that the statute required the commission to yeah. to create this definition through regulation. Understood. Thank you. Other questions from members of the committee? Senator Wynn. I know you kind of uh, touched on this in the presentation, but if you could just elaborate more on the, the secondary sports pool, like brokerage, um, broker, having to just register as opposed to having a license? Like what was the determination in that? Or if you could just elaborate, I know you kind of touched on it. So yes, again on that point, um, <clears throat> we feel that registration is the appropriate level because um, as my colleague said, obtaining a full license when you don't conduct the same business model as sports pools um, proves to be untenable with the costs and actual fees associated with it. Um, and again, um, all these secondary sports ticket brokers uh, do is facilitate the transaction of the ticket itself. They don't set lines, they don't pay out um, any winning wagers or collect money on any uh, wagers. So regulating them in the same way that you would regulate the South Point Casino or the GSR Sportsbook, um, it just proves unworkable for their business model, um, particularly. And, and forgive me, I don't know, and hopefully you do know, and if you don't, I'm sure you have a phone a friend here. Um, do you know if, um, like, are there different types of licensing that we could look at as opposed to just registration or licensing? Is there anything kind of in between throughout the industry? Uh, Jeff Bowlers again, uh, B-O-L-L-E-R-S. 
I mean, there is between a non-restricted gaming license and registration, you have um, a restricted license, which is perhaps somewhat less onerous, uh, particularly in Clark County. Um, but licensure still is a much greater, you know, burden uh, on regulators and operators uh, relative to registration. Thank you. All right, Senator Orenshaw. Thank you, Chair, with your indulgence. Not really a question, more of a comment. It just uh, I think I might be one of the few people left in the building who remembers when Professor Bob Fess and Professor Jim Vignani started the program at the Boyd School of Law and had students come up and work on a bill and present a bill. Just so wonderful to see the, the law students doing this, and it's such a great tradition that, uh, that they started. So I just wanted to compliment them and, and uh, this wonderful program that, that uh, Professor Fess and Professor Jim Vignani started. Indeed, you did an excellent job, and I don't see any other questions for you. So uh, we'll invite you to take a seat in the front row while we uh, take testimony in support of SB 379. Anybody wishing to give support testimony is invited to the front here in Las Vegas, here in Carson City, or in Las Vegas, and we'll start here in Carson City um, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chair Scheibel. Good afternoon, and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Michael Alonso, and I'm going to, I don't think violate, but bend some of your rules and take a few opportunities here. Um, first of all, I appreciate uh, the sponsor uh, bringing the bill and the law students. I've had an opportunity to have some conversations with Mr. Billings on the foreign gaming part. As, as far as my testimony, um, I'm here on behalf of the Association of Gaming Equipment Manufacturers on one part and on behalf of Caesars Entertainment on another part, and then we're neutral on another part. So, um, so if you'll allow that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd appreciate it. Um, Section 4 in particular is very important to uh, AGEM, the manufacturers, and as uh, Ms. Denisova testified, the, the manufacturers end up sort of filing everybody um, because of the sort of the lack of specificity on, and I think it's just a kind of uh, something that's happened over time. And so we would like to work with the commission on trying to get that definition of, of what a gaming employee is in the manufacturing side a little bit more uh, tightened down, and I think that's the intent of what she's trying to do in Section 4. For Section 7, uh, we're actually, uh, I'm here on behalf of both of them, and, they, uh, and, and, and I'm looking at the bill as proposed to be amended because that would in include the operators, which would help Caesars Entertainment as well. And that is another just, I think, something that's happened over a long period of time where foreign gaming, the foreign gaming requirements have been around for a long time, and, and, and things have changed, and I think it's just one of those things where you have to look at that again and, and see what's really necessary for the manufacturers and the operators to have to be reporting on a regular basis. It can be burdensome, and I think the changes are good. Um, and with respect to the other portion of the bill, uh, neither one of my clients takes a position on the secondary sports pool wagering broker. Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. The uh, question I have is, what is lacking in NRS right now to allow the commission to do this already? I mean, why have they overlooked this supposedly from the testimony for years, and now it's supposedly something we have to get to NRS? I mean, we give those guys a tremendous amount of flexibility under NRS. Have they just failed to do it, or is this something they've overlooked? Uh, what's the reasoning behind the bill? And Madam Chair, uh, to you and through you to Senator Hansen. I don't know that it's something that's been overlooked. I do think that the commission and the board look for guidance from the legislature on policy, and it's just probably an issue that hasn't really come up. And um, because in manufacturers, there is a definition of gaming employee. It's just very broad and probably a little vague, and maybe at the time it was intentionally done that way. Um, but these companies are all over the place, and they have a lot of employees that don't necessarily touch the machine or anything related to how a wager is done. 
And so I think it's just something that um, there's a workshop today that the Gaming Control Board is doing uh, based on the governor's uh, executive order to try to look at some of these regulations. And so I think from this standpoint, it's probably just guidance to the commission from the policymaking body that we should look at this issue. Okay, well, that helps. But is anybody from the commissioner board here to testify on this? I didn't. Anybody? I don't see anybody. No, I'm just kind of curious. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the bill from what I can tell, but I'm more, more you know, I hate to see redundancy and maybe in some cases even uh, providing NRSs when these things should be handled administratively with more flexibility. I don't have to come back in two years if we goof something up. So, anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think we do have a member of the board somewhere. I, I see them signed in. I'm not sure if it was here or in Las Vegas. There we go. And I Good don't know if Chair Scheibel. thank you. I don't know if you already heard Senator Hansen's question and are prepared to answer or want him to clarify it all. I believe I understood it. For the record, Kirk Hendrick, Chair of the Game and Control Board, also with me present is Judge George Assad, board member of the Nevada Game and Control Board. Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Alonzo answered the question very well to you, Senator Hansen, through the chair. Oh, you can go direct. Oh, you can go direct. Thank you. His response uh, from Mr. Alonzo about uh, this has just been on the statutory control for quite some time. It probably looks like it is time for the commission to review it, but as standard practice, uh, because this is not the Gaming Control Board's bill, the board can neither support, oppose uh, the bill itself, but we have been working with the students to try to craft language that would be suitable to presenting to the commission if the statute was changed. Thank you for that explanation. I just want to make sure you guys were in on the, on the process. I didn't know if this is something Boyd School of Law did, nothing good for you guys, but I want to make sure also that you guys actually feel a need for a change in the Nevada Revised Statutes rather than just handle it through a normal regulatory process. Again, for the record, Chair Kirk Hendrick from the Game Control Board. Uh, thank you, Senator Hansen. Yes, uh, this wasn't something obviously generated by the board, but the students did bring it to our attention. As Mr. Alonzo stated, uh, the industry is also aware of it. So we will be working with both the students and the industry to be sure that the language is comfortable for the board and the commission. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. All right, I think we were in the middle of testimony in support of SB 379, so we will go back to testimony and support. I see somebody else here in uh, Carson City to give support testimony. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Good day, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Ian Epstein, and I'm the founder of PropSwap. It is my pleasure to speak today in support of SB 379. Secondary markets are a fundamental component of every industry. If you wish to sell your home, you can list it for sale on websites like Zillow. If you wish to sell your car, you can, wish it, you can list it for sale on websites like AutoTrader. If you wish to list your concert ticket, you can list it for sale on websites like StubHub. Unfortunately, as I sit here today, the Nevada sports betting industry does not function as those I just mentioned. This was not always the case though. Back in 2015, Myself and my co-founder created the concept of PropSwap to allow Nevada residents to sell their sports betting tickets on an open marketplace. Prior to launching the company, we presented our business model to members of the Gaming Control Board and addressed their several valid questions and concerns. After that June 2015 meeting, it was the informal decision from the Gaming Control Board that PropSwap's business model was non-jurisdictional to the board. Presumably, the reason for this decision is that a sports book ticket is considered bearer paper and is the property of the person who made the wager, no different than a house, car, or concert ticket. Um, I made some handouts in terms of how the, the business works um, that you will have access to um, uh, after the, the hearing. Um, but Prop, PropSwap began operating as a Nevada-only company in August 2015. Over the course of the next several years, PropSwap was embraced by customers as well as sportsbook operators who were eager to form various partnerships. Sportsbooks understand that the existence of a neutral third-party marketplace is only accretive to their business and is a boon to their bottom line. I'll, I'll provide a parallel non-gaming example. 
Back in 2017, I was interested in purchasing Golden Knights season tickets, which required payment for 41 home games. I was, of course, excited to cheer on Las Vegas' first professional sports team, but I knew there was no way I was going to be able to attend all 41 games. Before I purchased the season tickets, I asked the Golden Knights ticket rep if there was a way to sell my tickets for games I couldn't attend, to which they answered, yes, we have a partnership with StubHub and you can sell any of your tickets on their marketplace. That piece of information pushed me over the hump and got me to buy the full season ticket package. Knowing that I had the ability to resell my tickets encouraged me to make this large purchase. Sports bets are no different. With the existence of PropSwap, customers are motivated to make more wagers for higher dollar, dollar amounts, knowing that they have the ability to sell them at a later date. This is one of the reasons why sports books were so welcoming of PropSwap. The only issue was that books were not given any guidance from the Game Control Board in terms of whether they could do business with PropSwap. Although the board had given PropSwap tacit approval to, to conduct its business, because there was no licensing or registration framework for sports wagering ticket brokers, sports books did not want to enter into agreements with an unlicensed or unregistered company. Then, in 2018, PropSwap began working with the then Chief Enforcement Division of the board to craft language very similar to SB 379 that would be part of a Gaming Control Board omnibus bill during the 2019 legislative session. Unfortunately, after months of work, this language was removed from the bill by the then newly appointed board chairwoman. Despite the bill change, PropSwap continued to operate in Nevada with the board's knowledge, as well as other jurisdictions, after the US Supreme Court overturned PASPA, allowing other states to legalize sports betting. Using our experience in Nevada, PropSwap gained approval to operate in states such as New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, and many others, which we currently still operate in today. Unfortunately, one of the states we do not operate in is Nevada. This is due to a reversal position by the Gaming Control Board in August 2021 in the form of a three-sentence letter from yet another new board chair that essentially expressed a different interpretation of the same Nevada laws that we have been complying with since 2015. In the years since the ruling, we have tried tirelessly to work with the Gaming Control Board to come to a resolution that would allow PropSwap and other potential sports wagering ticket brokers to operate in Nevada. This included drafting a BDR that individuals from the Attorney General's office even had input on. But yet, the board still said they would oppose the bill. That is why I was so pleasantly surprised when I learned of SB 379 and the work that has been done by the Boyd Law School students. This bill was written completely independent of any input from our company. In addition to the handout of how PropSwap works, there's also a handout with a timeline of events that I've listed out uh, that has led me uh, here to appearing today. The Game and Control Board will tell you that SB 379 is not feasible because it, it will result in exorbitant cost to the board and bring severe harm to the industry. What they will fail to tell you is that in the six years of PropSwap's operating in Nevada, there were zero complaints, zero violations, and zero additional work incurred to the board. The Gaming Control Board will also tell you that this service is something that should only be licensed. However, I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. It was my impression that the board was neutral on this bill. Uh, the I, I, that's a question for the board. Thank you, Chair. For the record, again, Kirk Hendrick, Chair of the Gaming Control Board, along with Member Judge George Assad. Uh, yes, pursuant to executive policy, the board has to remain neutral on any bill that it doesn't present. Thank you very much. We will be presenting. Sorry, I apologize, okay. Chair. We will be presenting our concerns, though, during the neutral section. Understood. Got it. Understood. Got it. Thank you. And Chair, if I may, just while we're in the middle of the testimony, I wanted the record to accurately reflect that the first professional sports in Nevada was the WNBA champions, Las Vegas Aces. <laughs> Women play sports uh, I, too. Uh, that, that is, I, I, apologize, I apologize for that. The second uh, Las Vegas and, you know. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, just continuing on. Uh, uh, the Game Control Board uh, will most likely tell you that this is a service that should only be licensed. However, only non-restricted gaming locations, i.e. casinos, are able to obtain a sports wagering license. So, PropSwap would not be able to get licensed under the board's proposed solution to this problem unless PropSwap were able to acquire a casino. Meanwhile, 
existing licensed sportsbook operators have always had the opportunity to offer the service prop swap offers, but in the more than eight years, none have chosen to do so. So, licensing is not a feasible solution. On the other hand, registration, which is what SB 379 calls for, offers a reasonable answer and allows the board to have oversight with the ability to call a sports wagering ticket broker forward for a finding of suitability if the circumstances justify it. The Nevada sports betting industry is trending in the wrong direction. Sports books in the state have recorded year over year decreases in monthly handle eight out of the last nine months. A secondary market can change this. Yet the Game Control Board has continually spent their resources creating barriers for a company that wants to operate in a regulated environment. If the board achieves their wish to only grant casinos access to offering the service, then the status quo will remain and Nevada bettors will continue, to, can, will continue to lack the ability to resell their tickets, or even worse, will be forced to use a service that operates on the black market, while residents of 27 other states take part in this marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I urge you to pass 379 as it is, not so that Nevada can lead the charge on this matter, but rather so that Nevada can catch up to where other states currently are. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, you, you may have. I think we do have a couple of questions, starting with Senator Wynn. Sorry, I just felt like I was in an infomercial there for a second for a prop swap. But um, I, ha <laughs> I have a question about um, some of the comparisons that you made and kind of how you would address this is, um, and I appreciate you answering some of these questions for me. I think you're in the best um, position to answer those. When we're talking about like resale of concert tickets or professional sports teams or any other like show in the Vegas Strip, arguably that's different. I mean, those are shows. They're not gaming. So how do you make that differentiation between like the fact that you're selling on a secondary market gaming, like gaming? <laughs> Um, Ian Epstein, uh, for the record, and first of all, I apologize if that came off as an infomercial, but I just thought it, it, it was needed to tell the whole the saga uh, of how it led me here today. It was, it was very informative, okay. actually. Um, so it's the, the, the similarities between, you know, uh, we use the analogy like, like a baseball card, right? Like you, if you want to buy a card of a rookie today, you're buying it because you think it may go up in value, uh, and then you can sell it, right? Because you're basically thinking that player's gonna, gonna do well. Uh, same thing with a house, same thing potentially with a car. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm, you know, just because it's, it's a ticket that, that came from a gaming establishment doesn't really change the, the function of it, which is A, you know, that you, that you it's a piece of, it's a ticket as, a, as if your property, and sometimes people sell for more than they paid for it, and sometimes the people sell for less than they paid for it. It's not, you know, always, you know, uh, go, going in, in one direction. I, I guess my concern is, is at the end of the day, it's gaming. I know that you're not setting the lines, and I know you're claiming you're just selling a paper, but some of the protections that we have in place for problem gamblers or um, some of the other things that licensees are, like, under and have, like, those kind of obligations to um, – you know, by diminishing it and making it sound like it's just a piece of paper. I just have concerns that with merely a registration as opposed to that full licensing that there might be issues. And then, uh, so I guess that's more of a comment. And then the second kind of question I have, is this just around sports betting um, that this would apply? Or let's say, and I know some people are not going to like, let's say we have a lottery here and you buy a lottery ticket. I mean, is that how it works in other markets outside of the state of Nevada? Like, are you able to purchase a lottery ticket and then buy it before the drawing and then have it? Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll answer both those questions. The, the, the first one is that, and I think this is a key thing, and, and it kind of talks about in the, how the, the selling process works uh, uh, pamphlet, but the seller makes the wager at the licensed sports book. So any sort of AML or problem gambling or KYC concerns are addressed uh, with the seller at that time they make the wager. If they then choose to list it for sale on the PropSwap website and it sells and it wins, we send the ticket to the buyer and it's the buyer's responsibility to cash the ticket. And so the buyer will also have to pass through any sort of AML or KYC concerns. And so, you know, we are just the middleman in terms of the transferring of ownership of the ticket. But in terms of making the wager or redeeming the wager, that is all uh, on the customers. And, and as the middleman, we don't have any um, role in that. 
So again, that's my concern is that if you had a problem gambler who was just purchasing from second on the secondary market, like numerous tickets, numerous tickets, numerous tickets, there would be no, you know, they wouldn't encounter those signs that talk about problem gambling. They wouldn't have any of those things. Is that my understanding? Um, Unless they went to cash a successful ticket. Right. So uh, in other states, uh, we, you know, we've talked to regulators and operators in terms of them sharing with us their problem, uh, their, their uh, excluded list, which we are happy to incorporate. Uh, in terms of PropSwap having our own independent excluded list, um, that is obviously something we are happy to do. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, requiring a licensure to also integrate, a, you know, uh, a, an excluded list um, you know, isn't, is necessary. I think that it, but you know, if you, if part of the, the registration was, you know, you must uh, have a self exclusion list, I, that's uh, clear, uh, obviously something we would do. And like I said, we're happy to integrate other states or other operators, uh, excluded list, uh, as well. Um, in regards to your other question about does it apply to anything else? We only deal in sports, uh, in sports bets. However, there are other companies, uh, one's called like jackpot and one's called Jack pocket, which is very confusing, but they are, huge international companies where you can you go there on the website and you can have you ask for a lottery ticket and then like they go make a lottery ticket for you and like they, they are the middleman for lottery tickets and you don't even have you don't have to go they send someone to the store basically to print you off a lottery ticket and you buy it through their website so there is a whole there's a whole lottery industry for that as well other senator hansen Thanks. First of all, Mr. Epstein, I, I'm always impressed when people find markets out there, you know, and you're one of those entrepreneurial people that found this market. The only question I got on your, your, your chart is step three, buyer purchase ticket on props. Up. Why, why in this thing, why can't step three be step one? I mean, why, why would they need to buy it through? Why couldn't they just place a wager at a sports book? That's a, that's a fantastic, fantastic question. Uh, thank you. Um, so the reason why buyers, you know, uh, purchase tickets is because the seller is able to offer them a, de a better deal than what's available at the sports book, right? So let's say, for example, you got the Golden Knights to win the Stanley Cup at 20 to 1 odds. Now they're down to 5 to 1 at the at Caesars Palace. But because you're holding a 20 to 1 ticket, you're able to sell it for, for you know, a profit, but offer the buyer you know, better than 5 to 1 odds than what they would currently find at the, at the casino. And so even if you have access to all the sports books in the world, you know, uh, you can find discounts on PropSwap by buying from another individual versus um, versus going to the casino. Again, it's fascinating to me. You find those little niches like that. Because in my mind, I'm like, look, why do they need you? Just go buy a, a ticket at, at the sports book. You know? Yeah. So anyway, I, I, very interesting. And the only the only question we had in our in your it almost sounded like you were in opposition to the bill. <laughs> I guess you've been dealing with the gaming control board for a while because your testimony almost sounded like. You're ready to fight already before we've even heard the opposition testimony. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been, it's been a struggle for you. I can it's, see it's it's been I, a, it's been a long, uh, you know, seven years. Saga. I read yeah. your timeline. Yeah. yeah, I got it. So, all right, thank you, Madam Chair. Were there other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. We are still in support testimony on SB 379. I don't see anybody else coming to testify in person in Carson City or Las Vegas, so we will go to the phones for support testimony on SB 379. You would like to testify in support of SB 379. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers testifying in support. All right, we will move to neutral testimony on SB 379 and invite anybody wishing to give neutral testimony to the table in uh, Las Vegas or Carson City. I don't see anybody coming in Carson City, so we'll go straight to Las Vegas for neutral testimony. Good afternoon again, Chair Scheibel, Vice Chair Harris, and members of the committee. For the record, again, I am Kirk Hendrick, Chair of the Nevada Game and Control Board. Also present with me today is Judge George Assad, member of the Nevada Game and Control Board, as well as Jim Barbie, the Chief of the Nevada Game and Control Board Technology Division. Pursuant to standard practice, since this is not the Game and Control Board's bill, 
the board will neither be supporting or opposing the bill, but is remaining neutral. That having been said, please allow me to applaud the gaming law students who presented their respective sections of SB 379. The board, of course, encourages student participation in the legislative process. However, the board would be remiss if the record did not reflect the concerns that the board has regarding sections 2, 3, and 6 of SB 379 pursuing to secondary sports pool wagering brokers. Specifically, if the proposed secondary sports pool wagering brokers are permitted to only be registered as proposed in the Senate bill, if they're only registered with the board rather than being licensed by the board, it would create an entirely new category of gaming regulation in what we all know as a highly regulated gaming industry in the state. Additionally, while board members and staff enjoyed meeting with the law students via video conference a couple of weeks ago, the board still has multiple unanswered questions regarding how many regulations the Nevada Gaming Commission would need to pass in order to have secondary sports pool wagering brokers comply with all federal, state, and local laws and regulations that license rates and sports book pools already have to adhere to. Those would include anti-money laundering, know your customer, cash transaction reports, IRS W-2 gaming and other tax reporting requirements, patron disputes, suspicious activity reports, responsible wagering, just to name a few. Also by law, it should be noted that a licensed race book and sports pool does not have to cash a ticket from someone that it does not know was the one who actually placed the wager. Finally, I believe it is important for the committee to be aware that secondary sports wagering pool broker activity is the subject matter of a legal action filed in 2021 by Prop Swap Company against the board and is currently on appeal to the state Supreme Court based on a favorable district court ruling on behalf of the state. Regarding the other sections of 379, board staff has reviewed the language and again, while the board remains neutral, the board does wish to work with further with the students and the gaming industry to be sure that those sections are appropriately worded to effectuate effective regulation for the industry. With that, I thank you for your time and the judge and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, any questions from members of the committee? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Is there anybody else in Las Vegas wishing to give neutral testimony. I don't see anybody else coming up to the front, so we will go to the phones for neutral testimony on SB 379. We'd like to testify in neutral for SB 379. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no cause to testify in the neutral. All right, then that brings us to the conclusion of testimony. Uh, would you like to make any closing remarks? I think I forgot opposition. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I did. I did. Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> We'll do testimony in opposition to SB 379 starting here in Carson City in person. Um, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Scheibel and Assistant Chair Harris. And I wish, I'm Virginia Valentine with the Nevada Resort Association. And I, I wish like um, my colleague, Mr. Alonzo, I could say that I'm here to support me neutral on all it, but I, I will say we are here to support the foreign gaming sections we are neutral on the employee sections that deal with manufacturers, and uh, we are opposed to the section that deals with the secondary ticket market. Unlike ticket, uh, concert ticket sales or sports ticket sales, um, secondary sports pool wagering presents scenarios that pose significant challenges for Nevada's licensed sports books to comply with federal and state AML and KYC protocols. For example, in a secondary sports pool wager, a licensed sports book will only interact with a patron making the initial wager and the patron presenting the winning ticket for payment. In this scenario, at no point will the book interact with the secondary broker, nor have the ability to verify the identity or status of such broker. 
A patron that has been designated as a high AML risk could also potentially use a broker to place and redeem wagers without our knowledge and thus evade AML controls. While the bill is silent on the issue, an obligation that Sportsbook track, confirm, and report whether a sports wagering ticket was part of a secondary sportsbook wagering transaction would impose an unworkable administrative burden upon Nevada's licensed sportsbook. Additionally, SB 379 would also pose challenges from a risk management standpoint. The bill would essentially authorize messenger betting, a situation where a person is paid to place wagers on behalf of a patron, and give rise to a situation where a sports betting ticket is sold on the secondary market, potentially multiple times, to patrons to whom the sports book would not sell the wager in the first place, for AML, KYC, or risk management decisions. Risk rating customers and conducting customer due diligence would be impossible for sportsbooks as they would not know the ultimate beneficiary of a waiver at the time the waiver was initially made. So to us, this looks a lot like gaming. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the students, um, uh, both uh, Veronica Dinanosova and uh, student Doug Billings reached out early, um, presented white papers, offered answered questions, and they were truly a delight to work with. So thank you very much for that. All right, thank you again. Um, anybody else in Las Vegas? Not seeing anybody coming to the table. I will go to the phones for opposition testimony on SB 379. You would like to testify in opposition of SB 379. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no calls to testify in opposition. All right, then. That brings us to the conclusion of our testimony on SB 379, and I'll invite... Oh, no closing comments. All right, then. That brings us to the conclusion of our hearing on SB 379. It looks like I do have all of my senators here, so um, we will move to our work session. Um, yes, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Guinan to walk us through the work session document. Thanks, Chair. Uh, for the record, Patrick Guinan, we have a work session with, I want to say, eight bills on it today. Anyway, um, I'll just go through them in numerical order. We begin with Senate Bill 222, which revises provisions relating to juries. This is a bill sponsored by Senator Harris that we heard here on the 13th of March. Uh, Senate Bill 222 expands the pool of persons who may serve on a jury in either a criminal or civil, civil trial by requiring the Department of Health and Human Services upon request by a judge or jury commissioner to provide a list of names of persons who receive public assistance for use in jury selection and requiring a jury commissioner to include such information in the list of qualified electors who may serve on a jury. The bill also provides that a person whose civil right to serve on a civil jury upon discharge from parole or probation is equally eligible to serve on a criminal jury and it increases the fees or the fee excuse me paid to a juror or a grand juror from forty dollars to sixty five dollars per day there's an amendment proposed by senator harris which adds a new section to clarify that parties may challenge a prospective juror and courts may remove a prospective juror based on actual implied or inferred bias and it amends the effective date of the bill to allow for implementation that's all all right, any questions on SB 222? Not seeing any questions. I'd accept a motion to amend and do pass. So moved. Second. I, I have a motion from Senator Orenshaw and a second from Senator Wynn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to start over. Just vote no. <laughs> any discussion on the motion? Why, thank you, Madam Chair. I was considering voting no. No, I, actually, I, I, I am going to vote no uh, because i very uncomfortable. It just seems ironic that we just had a bill where we're going to take away somebody's Second Amendment rights for 10 years on a gross misdemeanor. But here we're going to have people that just got out of prison, basically, uh, being allowed to serve on juries dealing with criminal law. And there's just a, there should be a reasonable space between those things. And the current law allows a six-year window, which seems reasonable. I'm also a little uncomfortable with forcing them to provide a list of people that are on public assistance, nothing against people on public assistance, but to make it mandatory that they provide that to a, to a potential jury selection process. Just I, I don't see where we're going with that. It just seems like we're, we're, we're creating burdens that shouldn't be there. 
So uh, yes, I am going to vote no, and thank you for allowing me to have that opportunity to get that on the record. Absolutely. All right, any other discussion? Not seeing any, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? All right, so it looks like Senator Hansen and Stone are nays on SB 222, um, but the motion passes, and I will assign the floor statement to Senator Harris, and that takes us to SB 252. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. SB 252 is a bill sponsored by Senator Flores uh, that revises provisions governing civil actions, which we heard here on the 30th of March. Uh, it expands the lists of costs that a court <clears throat> is authorized or required to award to a prevailing party depending on certain factors to include fees for the provision of a focus group and defines the term focus group for the purposes of the bill. There are no amendments. All right. Any questions on SB 252? I don't see any questions, um, so I would accept a motion to do pass SB 252. We have a motion from Senator Orenshaw and a second from Senator Wynn. Discussion on the motion. Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. I had a very lengthy discussion with, I forget the name of the attorney that presented it with, with Senator Flores. Very, very interesting conversation. Um, the, the focus of the types of groups he was dealing with, though, was typically in the millions of dollar range. And then I had other people come and said, look, in those cases, it makes complete sense to have these sorts of focus groups. But on stuff significantly under that, it, it may add an additional burden. Right now, under existing law, a judge does have an opportunity to, to include those costs. And th the, to make those costs mandatory is where the real problem is. So uh, while I think the whole idea is excellent, I don't think we should make it mandatory since we already have a level of discretion that probably should remain in place in state law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Any other discussion on the bill? All right, not seeing any. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? nay? All right, it looks like nays are Senators Stone, Krasner, and Hansen. The rest are yays, and uh, the motion carries. With that, I will assign the floor statement to Senator Flores. Okay, Patrick Garner, for the record, we're now at Senate Bill 309, which uh, makes changes relating to health care. This is a bill brought by the majority leader. We heard it here on April 3rd. SB 309 creates the crime of fertility fraud and associated criminal penalties for committing the offense. A health care provider who commits fertility fraud by implanting his or her human reproductive material in a patient without their consent or who implants human reproductive material in a patient other than that expressly agreed to by a patient is guilty of a category B felony. A person other than a health care provider such as an employee of a health care provider who commits fertility fraud by knowingly conveying false information to a patient is guilty of a category C felony. The bill also provides for a civil cause of action by a victim and adds fertility fraud to the list of sexual offenses for which a perpetrator must register as a sex offender. Other statutory provisions governing sex offenders are also added in this bill. And finally, the bill provides that a health care facility should not provide a patient with a human reproductive material except in accordance with a written agreement between the concerned parties and provides penalties for violating these provisions, including civil penalties and suspension or revocation of a facility's license. There are no amendments. All right, any questions on SB 309? Not seeing any, I would accept a motion to do pass. I so there is a motion from Senator Wynn and a second from Senator Stone. Any discussion on the motion? I don't see any discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Uh, motion carries unanimously to do pass SB 309, and I will assign the floor statement to Senator Canizaro. We're now at Senate Bill 321. <clears throat> this is a bill that revises provisions relating to crimes. It was brought by Senator Krasner, and we heard it here on the 31st of March. SB 321 provides that no law enforcement agency or forensic laboratory will store or share the DNA of a profile, excuse me, the DNA profile of a sexual assault survivor unless required by federal law or pursuant to a court order if it's necessary to identify or prosecute the perpetrator of the assault. 
Law enforcement is prohibited from using such forensic evidence to prosecute the survivor for any crime, to search for evidence of any other crime the survivor may have committed, or for any other purpose that is not directly related to the sexual assault. The bill also requires, to the extent money is available, each relevant entity in the state to conduct an audit of the DNA information it stores or maintains, to analyze compliance with state law and preservation of such evidence, and to identify the number of DNA profiles that should have been collected in 2021 but were not. The results of these audits are to be submitted to the Joint Interim Standing Committee on the Judiciary by January 1 of 2024. There is an amendment proposed by Chair Scheibel in consultation with the sponsor that is attached on the following page. The amendment adds language providing that a law enforcement agency may include a DNA profile in a database if required to do so by federal law and that law enforcement may share biological evidence of a survivor if obligated to do so as part of the discovery for a trial. That's all, Chair. All right, any questions on SB 321? All right, not seeing any questions. I would accept a motion to amend and do pass. All right, I have a motion from Senator Orenshaw and a second from Senator Harris. Any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any, all in favor say aye. Aye, any opposed nay? A uh, motion to amend and do pass carries unanimously and I will assign the floor statement to Senator Krasner. That takes us to SB 354. Thanks, Chair. SB 354 relates to justices of the peace. This is a bill brought by the chair that was heard here on March 31st. It requires the justice of the peace to have received a passing score on the multi-state professional responsibility examination unless the National Conference of Bar Examiners prohibits the justice of peace from registering for and taking the exam. The chair has proposed an amendment in con consultation with the administrative office of the courts. That amendment is attached. It strikes the original requirement concerning the multi-state professional responsibility examination and instead adds the following language. Um, I can read that, chair, or you can, we can just move on if you want to. Th that's okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Guinan. Um, I hope all of you are looking at the work session document. There is an amendment attached. Um, basically, what the amendment says is that the, um, Judiciary will develop a test for judicial can for justices of the peace to take and pass um, within 18 months of being appointed or elected to that position. Um, and we can read it out loud if, if you'd like. Are there questions about the amendment? Um, I did talk to the judiciary about it and the Supreme Court and the judges of limited jurisdiction, I believe, are in support. They're nodding at me from the back. Sorry, Senator Hansen. Just a quick question. I think the amendment may have cleared it up. The question is, you get Justice of Peace runs for office. After they're elected, they have to take this. If they fail, your amendment gives them 18 months to, to clean that up? Or, I mean, what happens if you fail after you've been elected by the people to be a JP? Um, the way that the amendment is drafted, if you failed that exam you and it was less than 18 months, you'd have an opportunity to take it again. If you were unable to pass it within 18 months, then you would not be eligible to take office. And so that uh, seat would end up vacated and you have to go through the same appointment process. Okay, that makes sense. I was just trying to wonder what happens if you can't pass the test. So it, that's the answer. Thank yep. you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to, um, by way of clarification, um, the amendment was drafted so that this could either be a freestanding test or it could be incorporated into the judicial college as a kind of final examination, which I think is the direction that um, the stakeholders plan to go with this, but we wanted to leave it open so that uh, whatever makes sense when we start to develop the, we, when people smarter than me start to develop the test, determine it makes sense. Um, Senator Stone. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, could you just uh, maybe articulate uh, is there any direction as to what the format of the, the test is going to encompass judicial ethics, judicial procedures, um, basically making sure that somebody has a solid foundation to be a judge, I presume? Yes, excellent question. Um, the amendment doesn't prescribe the format of the test um, in terms of whether it be essays or multiple choice, but it does prescribe that it would have to include judicial decorum, uh, civil and criminal procedure as relevant to their jurisdiction, orders of protection, um, and accounting standards for attorneys who would be appearing in front of them. Any other questions? Yeah, Senator Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, is there any guidance in the bill as amended as to what the standard should be for the cutoff score? Or is there some risk that 
you know, they may decide you just need a 50% to pass. Just a thought. Um, so it, it does not, it does not prescribe part of, um, developing the test would include developing what a passing score would be. All right. If there are no other questions, I would accept a motion to amend and do pass. I have a motion from Vice Chair Harris, a second from Senator Orenshaw. Any discussion on the motion? All right. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. This passes unanimously, um, and I will take the floor statement. That takes us to SB 401. Thanks, Chair. SB 401 is a bill sponsored by Senator Flores, which revises provisions relating to punitive damages. We heard the bill here on April 4th. Uh, SB 401 just removes a requirement from Chapter 42 of the NRS concerning the awarding of punitive damages. The language being deleted provides that before consuming or using alcohol or another substance, the defendant knew that he or she would thereafter operate the motor vehicle. That phrase is struck, um, and that's all there is. No amendments, Chair. All right, any questions on SB 401? I don't see any questions, so I'd accept a motion to do pass. So moved. Second. All right, there's a motion from uh, Senator Wynn and a second from Senator Hansen. All those in favor, oh, sorry, any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any, all those in favor, aye. Aye, any opposed, nay. All right, I think we have a, another unanimous vote for SB 401, and I'll assign the floor statement to Senator Flores. All right, next we have Senate Bill 413, which is a committee bill brought uh, on behalf of a rec or on behalf of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on the Judiciary as a recommendation from the interim. Uh, it relates to credits to reduce the sentences of, an, of offenders, um, and we heard it here on April 7th. The bill provides a revised method for determining credits <clears throat> for the reduction of an offender's sentence such that an eligible offender who complies with programming and placement identified in a risk and needs assessment must be allowed credit against the minimum term or maximum aggregate term of a sentence up to an equivalent of 25% of the offender's sentence. Similar provisions are set forth regarding credits for good behavior. The provisions in the bill do not apply to an offender convicted of a Category A or B felony or a felony involving use of force of violence, a felony sexual offense, or certain felony DUI offenses. Additionally, the bill applies to an offender sentenced on or after July 1 of 2025 or to an offender sentenced prior to that date if the offender chooses to be subject to the revised method. There is an amendment offered by Senator Harris um, at the initial hearing on the bill, which is attached. The amendment changes the percentage in the revised method from 25 to 35% of the sentence and requires the director of NDOC to report to the offender and the parole board on the programs required and available to an offender and which were completed based on availability. And I'm told that we have an additional uh, minor amendment requested by the Attorney General's Office that Senator Harris would like to share with the committee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Guinan. Um, after discussions with the Attorney General's Office, I'd also like to submit a conceptual amendment where we strike the term irrevocable from election. So that it will not be an irrevocable election. It's just the offender will make an election. All right, any questions on SB 413? Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I would accept a motion to amend and do pass. Second. All right, we have a motion from Senator Wynn, a second from Senator Orenshaw. Any discussion on the motion? All right, not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Um, so that is uh, seven yays, and Senator Don Darrow Loop is uh, excused. She had to go to another work session. Um, and so with that, we will move to SB 417. Oops, floor statement will go to Senator Harris. Actually, it'll go to Senator Wynn. Okay. Final bill on the work session today is SB 417. This relates to common interest communities. It's a committee bill that we just heard on April 11th. Senate Bill 417 prohibits an 
unit owner, tenant, guest, or invitee of a unit owner in a homeowner association from taking or encouraging another person to take retaliatory action against an executive board, board member, or employee for certain conduct. It also removes information relating to personnel from the list of records that a board must make available to the public and provides that a unit owner must pay the actual costs incurred by an association to provide certain records for review. Additionally, the Commission on Common Interest Communities and Condominium Hotels is authorized to impose sanctions on a person who files a vexatious, misleading, retaliatory, frivolous, false, or fraudulent affidavit with the Real Estate Division. There is an amendment proposed by Chair Scheibel uh, that is attached on the following page. The amendment just adds bullying to the actions prohibited under the bill's provisions and provides a definition of the term as it appears elsewhere in statute. That's all, Chair. All right. Any questions on SB 417? I don't see any, so I'd accept a motion to amend and do pass. All right, we have a motion from Senator Orenshaw, and I think that was a second from Senator Wynn. Um, any discussion on the motion? Mm -hmm. Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate your efforts to kind of balance the field with HOAs and, uh, and, and tenants. Um, I just have a concern um, that, you know, HOAs have tremendous power here in Nevada, and I worry about uh, stifling some free speech that could be subjectively viewed as hostile or misleading, uh, which could lead to a 10-year prohibition on somebody running for the board or be the beneficiary of a lawsuit which uh, would recover compensatory uh, damages. And so for those reasons, I respectfully have to vote no on this today. All right. Senator Orenshaw. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I appreciate all your hard work on the amendment and uh, working on this issue in Chapter 116. I'm supporting the bill. I just need a little more time to think about the, the amendment language and just reserve my right for the floor, but I'm supporting the bill today. I appreciate all your hard work. Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. I already discussed it with you. I am going to support the bill. I told you I would. Um, Senator Stone has raised some points just prior to the hearing that I hadn't considered, so I do want to have an opportunity to, to uh, uh, vet this more fur further, as you suggested as well. So while I am supporting it, I do uh, reserve my right. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I appreciate the discussion on the bill. We did just hear it, I believe it was yesterday, and so we're, we're on a deadline, so certainly we can continue to have conversations about it. Um, and at this time, unless there's any more discussion, I will um, ask those in favor to say aye. 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 And those opposed, nay. nay. All right, it looks like uh, nays are Senator Stone and Senator Krasner, and Senator Don Darrow Loop is excused. But the motion does carry, and I will assign myself the floor statement. And I believe that brings us to the end of our work session. All right, having completed our work session, we still have three more bills to hear today. Um, we will move next to SB 296, and I'll invite Vice Chair Harris down to the front to uh, make her presentation whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Dallas Harris. I know this is probably the first time you've seen me this session. That, that, was, that was a joke. Anybody? Okay. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you all today to present Senate Bill 296. Uh, to my left, I have my lovely intern this session, Dallas Figueroa. She will be accompanying me. Please be kind to her. Uh, and to my right, I have someone who should be very familiar to this committee, Ms. Lisa Mosley. And then I also have two folks on uh, the Zoom to present, Mr. Max Carter Oberstone, who is a police commissioner in San Francisco, as well as former Virginia delegate uh, Joshua Cole. And that's if we didn't bore them away. I'm hoping they, they were able to stick with us. Um, I'm just quickly going to uh, run through the bill and then allow my co-presenters to give their opening statements and we'll subject ourselves to questions after that. Uh, first and foremost, you should have uh, a copy of the bill on your desk. Please toss that, get rid of it. We're going to be working off of this mock-up. The bill has changed substantially, so you're just going to confuse yourself uh, if you try and look between the two. Uh, but the idea is the same. One thing I love about Nevada is the very strong libertarian streak that runs through this state. We are a leave-us-alone type people. I can get down with that. That's why... Today, that's why today, we have uh, 
wearing your seatbelt as a secondary offense. So if you didn't know, and don't tell too many people because you should have your seatbelt on, but if you didn't know, right now if you don't have your seatbelt on in the state of Nevada, police officers cannot pull you over just for that. Because we kind of want to be able to do our own thing. And by the way, there have been several times folks have decided they would come and try their best to move our secondary seatbelt law to a primary one for, I don't know, safety reasons. Uh, but we have never done that. And I think that this bill uh, gets at the gist of why we haven't, but with much less dangerous offenses. So if you can, committee, go ahead and flip all the way. We're just deleting, 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 all the way to page six. And if you look down to line 9.1, we are uh, making a couple of things secondary offenses. The first is vehicle registration. If, you are, if you're 60 days or less and you haven't re-registered your vehicle, as long as you got your hands on 10 and 2, and you are going the speed limit, and you have not broken any other law, we're going to let officers give you a break. Now, to be honest, they're doing it mostly anyway, right? But uh, we don't have to make registration a law enforcement officer's job. We made a choice to do that, but guess what? There are fines, there's fees. You go to the DMV, those fees are gonna stack on up. Day 61, your tag turns the wrong color for the third month, you're getting pulled over. I also wanna level set on this one a little bit. Right now, today in the state of Nevada, we require you to register your vehicle 30 days within coming to the state. Why? We want to know where you are. You hit somebody, you run, they get the license plate, but you don't live in California anymore or whatever state it is. We won't be able to find you. Guess what? That's a secondary offense. We're giving out of towners a bigger break than we give our own residents. And I would suggest that if you are 60 days late on your vehicle registration, unless you've moved in those 60 days, the cops are still going to be able to find you. We're just talking about the fact that you haven't made it down to the DMV or you haven't gotten that new tag. Section 9.3, a little bit down on uh, the page. This is about the proper display of your license plate. Maybe your license plate's in the wrong spot. As long as the cops can see it, what's the big deal? Right? At least that's my perspective. Section 9.4. This is about the uh, moving tag. Same deal here. You, you buy a new car, you don't have your moving permit in the right spot. Let's keep you rolling on your way. As long as you are on 10 and two and you are not speeding. Section 9.5. This is about, uh, as well as uh, 9.7, this is about all of those equipment things on your car that might break, except for headlamps. We left that in as a primary. So if your tail lights out, just one. If your brake lights out, just one. You're missing a reflector, just one. We're gonna let you keep rolling. Now, at the request of uh, our, the good folks in the law enforcement community, they have decided to be able to offer a public service and pull you over and let you know, hey, your brake light's out, hey, your tail lamp's out, and so we gave them that ability when it comes to these. They can issue a written or, uh, uh, or oral warning. Let you know, provide a service, sure, why not? Same thing with section 9.9, .9, that's the stop lamp. Stop lamp. Uh, that's about it. I think this bill makes a lot of sense. When you think about the things that we have as secondary today, uh, I don't think there's any way we can argue that a 60-day vehicle registration is really what we need to make sure we're pulling people over for. Let's let people go about their business as long as they are being safe. Let's let officers focus on the drivers that we heard about in committee yesterday. We need all of their attention. We want zero fatalities on our roads. Why are we clogging them up? 
with this ticky tacky stuff. And I'm, I, I'm not a law enforcement officer. I don't want to speak for them. But I will say, a lot of the times, I don't think they want to be doing some of these things either. We can make a choice today. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, my intern, Ms. Adalis Figueroa, to talk a little bit about what pretextual stops are and that context, uh, and then Ms. Mosley, and then we'll go to our folks on Zoom and answer any questions y'all might have. Thank you, Senator Harris. So good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary. My name is Idalis Figueroa, and for the record, that is I-D-A-L-I-S-F-I-G-U-E-R-E-O-A. Um, I am an intern with Senator Dallas Harris's office, and I'm happy to be here today to present this bill. Broadly, SB 296 uh, prohibits a peace officer from issuing a citation for certain violations relating to motor vehicles. Um, but the reason that this bill is being brought today is to tackle the issue of pretextual stops. Pretextual stops are when peace officers use minor offenses to perform traffic stops and then use these stops as a basis or a pretext to conduct a search and find other crimes. While we do understand that safety is a concern, um, when dealing with traffic stops, there have been amendments to, a lot of amendments to this bill, 296. So we have taken those um, thoughts into consideration. And Again, the intent of this bill is to eliminate or reduce pretextual stops and to let people be on their way. Thank you for your time, and that is all that I have. All right, Ms. Mosley. Rolling right along here. Um, yes, Chair Scheibel, committee members, it's so good to see you all again. I know um, you're going to see a lot of the Fines and Fees Justice Center today. Um, Lisa Mosley Sales, State Director for the Fines and Fees Justice Center. Um, let me spell my name for the record. Lisa is spelled L-E-I-S-A, Mosley, M-O-S-E-L-E-Y, Sales, S-A-Y-L-E-S. And I'm very um, excited and happy to pre be presenting or at least offering some of my remarks on this bill with Senator Harris today. Um, I hadn't planned on presenting, but you know, I learned that if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So uh, you just never know what you're going to get with the illustrious Senate Judiciary Committee. So. Um, uh, Chair Scheibel, uh, members of the committee, something we may not have all known, but traffic stops are the most common reasons for contact with uh, the police in the United States. Uh, there's research that shows that these traffic stops are not always for moving violations. Instead, they are for what we would consider administrative um, offenses, infractions completely unrelated to a motorist driving. These infractions include things like uh, Senator Harris mentioned a broken taillight, a uh, missing reflector, a uh, brake light, unilluminated brake light, or a license plate that's not displayed in its proper position. In 2020, um, a UNLV study that we commissioned for them, for a uh, Fines and Fees Justice Center working on Assembly Bill 116, showed that uh, of all the traffic tickets that had turned into warrant in Clark County, a whopping 58.6% of those traffic violations that turned into warrants were for administrative infractions. Yes, I, exactly, Senator Hanson, I <laughs> say the same thing. Only 16% of those were for moving violations or anything that was directly related to a motorist's driving. Based on nationwide research and data that we have all seen, we've become aware that these traffic stops are mostly, mostly impact communities of color, poor communities, particularly the black community. Something that is not as much discussed is the significant risk that they pose to law enforcement officers. According to a Department of Justice study um, conducted about um, the fatalities of law enforcement officers in 2017, the most common policing activity that leads to an officer fatality is an officer-initiated traffic stop. Clearly, this is an issue that needs to be addressed, and a handful of places such as Philadelphia, um, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and the state of Virginia have all taken steps to prioritize our communities and our law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. They've taken steps to limit some of these uh, traffic stops. I'm asking that Nevada add our name to that list and become one of those states one of those places that prioritizes our officers' safety and the safeties of our community. We know that doing so is going to free up our officers to focus on more serious crimes that directly impact public safety, and it's also going to preserve our state's already limited resources 
So with that, um, that, con those, that concludes my remarks. I'll turn it back over to Senator Harris and uh, stand for questions if you all have any. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. If we could, I want to see if we have Mr. Carter Oberstone uh, on the Zoom, police commissioner from San Francisco. Uh, Mr. Oberstone, Carter Oberstone, please begin when you're ready. Uh, well, Chair Scheibel, Vice Chair Harris, members of the committee, uh, committee staff, and members of the public, thank you so much for the invitation uh, this afternoon to appear before the committee. Uh, my name is Max Carter Overstone. I'm the Vice President of the San Francisco Police Commission. And I'm just going to speak briefly today about a policy that we, uh, we uh, recently enacted to curtail the use of pretext stops here in San Francisco. I'll, I'll try to briefly just cover three things. What the problem was as we saw it, how our policy endeavors to address the problem, and then finally the public outreach process that informed uh, the policy. So first, what was the problem? Uh, the, the, the problem was that it turns out that uh, our police department was making thousands upon thousands of stops every year for a cluster of low level traffic infractions that weren't doing anything to make San Franciscans safer. Uh, these infractions weren't leading to uh, deaths or injuries or crashes on our roadways and officers weren't finding uh, contraband in the course of these stops. We weren't finding guns, we weren't finding drugs. We also weren't making arrests, um, but we were using up an, an enormous amount of time and money that could be rerouted to other law enforcement strategies that are proven to stop and prevent crime. Uh, so that problem standing alone would have been enough to, to uh, step in with a policy solution. But the second problem is that these same stops that weren't providing any return on investment also just happened to be disproportionately carried out against people of color. Um, and so it really called into question our, our moral and constitutional obligation to uh, accord every citizen equal treatment under the law. So the solution, how, how did our policy uh, uh, try to address this problem? So our, our policy has two main prongs. The first is very similar to what Senator Harris just outlined. It identifies about nine uh, categories of low-level traffic offenses, things like registration and license plate offenses, and and um, you know uh, unilluminated uh, lights of various sorts, and it just says that these offenses can no longer be the sole reason for initiating a stop, while at the same time leaving open avenues for enforcement. So just to be clear, our, our policy limits stops, but but not enforcement, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that later if folks are interested. Um, the second thing that it does is that it limits what officers can do once a stop is made. Uh, one of the biggest incentives for, for initiating a pretext stop is the opportunity that the officer might have to search the vehicle. Uh, and so, and one of the ways officers often do that in the course of a pretext stop is that they don't have uh, probable cause to, to conduct a search. And so they try to get consent from the driver. And what our policy says is that in order to get a, a consent to search the car, officers need at least reasonable suspicion that there is some criminal activity afoot. So as long as the officer has some evidence grounded in fact that the, the driver or the occupant of the car um, is engaged in some type of criminal activity, then they can ask for consent to search or they can ask investigatory questions unrelated to the stop. But absent any shred of evidence, um, we, the officer can no longer engage in that conduct. Um, finally, I'll just talk about the public outreach. Um, and I'll just note, um, our chief of police supports this policy. And I think part of the reason that we were able to get support from so many diverse constituencies is that we really engage with the community at large. So from the earliest time, we, we, we made public a, a, a draft version of the policy so that the public would have something concrete to view and comment on and we received thousands of letters and emails all of which we published to our website uh, we also put together a working group of about 15 to 20 subject matter experts from diverse backgrounds people in law enforcement people in the legal community um, and we we held a series of four meetings where those experts kind of went over the policy line by line and offered feedback and comments uh, we also had community listening sessions. We had about a, a dozen 
community listening sessions where we went out to various parts of the city and scheduled them after working hours so regular folk could come out and uh, comment and give us feedback on the policy. And we also had some closed door listening sessions specifically for officers so that they could provide uh, feedback on the bill or on the policy, I should say. And um, the feedback that we got from officers was, was integral to the policy. And it, it's critical to us that we enacted something that could actually work in real life and that the folks charged with carrying it out could actually implement. Um, and so, so feedback from, from all of those various stakeholders were, were critical to what we did. The last part of our outreach process is we, we um, invited experts to come speak at commission hearings. This includes experts from various policy think tanks. We also invited a, a chief of police from a, another jurisdiction in North Carolina that implemented this policy. Um, and, and so we're able to also benefit from, from experts outside of the jurisdiction. So I will, I was told to keep it short, so I will uh, stop there and uh, mm -hmm. welcome any uh, questions from the committee uh, later on. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Carter Oberstone. We really appreciate your insight. Um, if I may, Madam Chair, I'd like to just briefly allow uh, former delegate, Virginia delegate, Mr. Joshua Cole, uh, to speak to the committee about uh, Virginia's state law process um, and maybe we'll have some uh, questions about the cool stuff on his wall. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, to Chair Scheibel and Vice Chair Harris. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present in support of SB uh, 296. Um, back in 2020, the Virginia General Assembly was called into a special session by our then governor, Ralph Northam, to create legislation to help curb um, uh, whether it was dealing with uh, crime legislation, dealing with uh, police brutality. And one of the particular bills we introduced was here in Virginia, HB 5058, which is pretty much identical to the bill that you all are considering today. A couple different things that we did was allow stopping pretextual stops where that would be um, everything you've listed, whether it's the license plate, the inspection sticker, tinted windows, um, those different things were saying, hey, we're watching what's happening throughout the Commonwealth and a lot of things are transpiring and we wanna make sure that our citizens and our law enforcement agents are protected. Um, we found out through a, uh, we created another bill in 2020 dealing with community policing reports. And so what we found out through that community policing report, the bill was released in 20, the report was released in 2021, um, that black Virginians bore the brunt of roadside traffic enforcement. Um, black Virginians accounted for 30% of traffic stops, despite only representing 19% of the state. Um, Latino and Latina drivers accounted for 9% of the stops, about equal a proportion to the population they represent. Um, and so we took this into consideration. We went into the special session in 2020 and we passed this bill. We had law enforcement agents who came out in support of the bill, um, and we had many other people. And so I would just urge you to support SB 296 today, looking at what we've done in Virginia and the work that we've tried to protect our citizens and our law enforcement agents. This is a common sense legislation, and I would urge you all to pass it. Thank you so much, Mr. Cole. Um, before we take questions, I just want to uh, hit on a couple of additional points. One, uh, the importance of the law enforcement community's engagement in this process, absolutely paramount. Um, Y'all didn't meet me yesterday. As I'm sure you know, I have had many many conversations with law enforcement. This amendment reflects those conversations. Um, their input was valuable and taken at just about every turn. Um, you know, I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, they've been a really good partner in, in working on this bill with me, um, and I very much appreciate that. Um, and that, you know, here in Nevada, while we have started traffic stop collection data, we don't have data to suggest that there are disparities uh, in traffic stops for our law enforcement officers. Um, but just about any study that's ever done a study on traffic stops suggests that there, that there are disparities. And while that is one piece uh, that we're hoping to potentially address in this bill, uh, the crux of it for me is that um, we need to ensure that our law enforcement officers uh, are putting themselves in dangerous situations when it's necessary. When, when we need to ensure that uh, 
a dangerous person on the road needs to be taken off the road or given some serious corrective measure. Uh, and we have absolutely no shortage of that, uh, especially down south in Las Vegas. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, we will stand for questions. All right. Um, do we have questions? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. First uh, question, the conversation with law enforcement, how many of those were on the side of the road? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question, Senator Hansen. I'm just kidding. I don't no. drive. <laughs> you don't drive, huh? All right. Thank goodness. Uh, your first bill was way over the top, so I'm glad to see this amended version because uh, I was going, to. Uh, you and I have had numerous discussions on this, and believe me, I'm completely on board. You need probable cause. The question, though, is, I wish Senator Wynn was here, um, aren't these now, they're not criminal law anymore, though, right? Aren't these now, because we de decriminalized all traffic citations, so your normal um, protections under criminal law don't exist now, I think. Is, is that correct? Because, you know, under criminal law, they, they have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. They have to have probable cause. I'm just curious now with the change in the law, are these still considered, are you protected, in other words, under the normal criminal protections of the, of the Bill of Rights? Thank you for the question, Senator Hansen. Dallas Harris, uh, for the record, we did, not, we did not decriminalize all traffic infractions. Um, and so this bill would not mess with any of that. And this really uh, has, it would have the same effect if we were still having criminal traffic stops, right? This is about, is there a probable cause to make the stop in the first place, uh, whether you're issuing a, a civil or criminal ticket at the end. Okay, I got it. But yeah, normally, you know, the, those protections are under under criminal law. So if we decriminalize, then in effect we made it, you know, a civil procedure. And so you lose some of those protections, ironically enough. Because, um, yeah, I'm completely on board with that. You and I have had the discussions, uh, uh, Shonda Summers Armstrong as well, you know, we're really boiled down to driving while black, right? That kind of uh, stops that aren't necessary. And what you're trying to do is eliminate the potential probable cause for that. Now, I noticed in the original bill, and I don't think it's in this one, if they find secondary cause, let's say they pull me over, hey, Hanson, your uh, taillight's out or whatever. Um, but then when they come up to the car to tell me that, they see something else that's clearly a violation of law. Under your original bill, you, you, as I understood it, you couldn't be prosecuted for that. You can under your amended version, it looks like. Thank you for the question, Senator Hansen. Uh, Senator Harris, for the record, under both versions, you would be able to be prosecuted for something that the officer discovered. Um, if they weren't supposed to, so I, this is a bit complicated when it comes to uh, search and seizure law, uh, but under the original bill, and even under this, this bill, uh, if you were not supposed to make a stop, that's a bad stop. And so you put at risk all of the evidence that you gather from a stop you weren't supposed to make in the first place. Now, if an officer discovers a uh, dead body in the back seat, uh, there's nothing, uh, in my opinion, in either bill that would stop them from uh, arresting you and investigating further. Okay, good. No, I, uh, maybe I misread it. Obviously, we only got a day to look at some of this stuff, and we're all kind of on overload trying to stay on top of some of this stuff. Well, I don't know. I, uh, the overall uh, concept, I, you know, you and I are in complete agreement on that. In an absence of probable cause, no matter what the circumstances are, you should be t protected with your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. So we'll, we'll uh, uh, visit that some more in the not-too-distant future. Um, but yeah, I do want to hear what the law enforcement community has to say, but, uh, you know, I, I'm completely on board. Unless there's reasonable probable cause, people should not be stopped or, or bothered at all. You have a reasonable expectation of privacy and no, uh, no search and seizures in the absence of that probable cause. Certainly something I agree with completely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Hansen. And I, I do want to note that um, this bill does not put any constraints around consent searches. Um, but I would encourage all of my law enforcement friends to think seriously about adopting a policy for when those consent searches are appropriate um, and, and tie that to additional probable cause or reasonable suspicion arising um, so that we aren't just uh, uh, digging a bit when you originally stop someone for uh, one of these low-level offenses. All right, Senator Stone. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Senator Harris. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, if a officer were, were was following somebody where their registration was expired, uh, would would this bill preclude them from running the license plate for possible stolen vehicle or any other suspicions? Thank you for the question, Senator Stone. Uh, no, it would not prevent law enforcement officers from running plates. As a matter of fact, it's my understanding they're probably running plates even if your registration's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, just just a concern I have. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, San Francisco. We have the gentleman from San Francisco. In the, in the past uh, three years, they've seen a uh, increase in crime by 111% of the national average, 7.5% over the past three years. Property crimes have increased 20%. Homicides have increased by 17%. Do you think there's any nexus to their policy that you're trying to enact here today that might have helped raise these criminal uh, activities. Thank you for the question, Senator Stone. Dallas Harris, for the record, I will give an answer and then throw it to Mr. Carter Oberstone for his thoughts as well. Um, but I can confidently tell you the answer is no. Policy was passed in January of 2023, has not yet gone into effect. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carter Oberstone. Uh, thank you, Senator Harris. Thank you for the question. Um, so, so yes, there there can be no causality between any change in crime rates, as the senator said, because the policy hasn't been implemented okay. yet. The only thing I would add um, is that um, the experience of other jurisdictions, as well as some really well-researched studies, confirm that uh, there is no correlation between limiting uh, low-level stops and crime rates. So, for example, there is an excellent study done on Nashville's change in policy by uh, Stanford's computational lab, uh, where they where they looked at uh, block by block crime rates, and 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 looked at the prevalence of low level traffic stops, and just found no correlation whatsoever between crime rates and um, and the prevalence of of, of uh, stops for low infractions. Uh, so that's just one study among many that's that's addressed this issue. I appreciate that. Uh, we have a policy in the. Uh, in the committee that if you have some research like that, if you could forward that to the committee, I'd greatly appreciate that. I'd like to read that myself. Thank you. Absolutely, will do. All right, other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Ornshaw. Thank you very much, Chair. And Senator Harris, thank you for bringing the bill. And I think that, I guess it's a little bit more of a comment. Thank you for your indulgence. I, I think, you know, if these low level stops can be handled, you know, administratively through the DMV if there's expired registration. Uh, I, I think that that will free up officers to focus on the more serious crimes. And I don't know, I understand it hasn't been implemented yet in San Francisco, so we don't have any, any um, testimony yet about what's happening there. But I really agree with you. I think that, that that will allow for more focus on the kind of things, you know, we heard about recently in some of the other bills the other day. So I really appreciate the bill and thank you for bringing it. Thank you for that, Senator Orange Shawl. And I'm going to say something you probably won't hear me say a lot, but you know, I want the police to keep on policing. Um, but this type of small things uh, really is not where they should be devoting their focus. And a good majority of them um, are electing to let these things go anyway, uh, because I would argue they've got much, much bigger fish to fry. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. We will move now into testimony. Um, at this point, I am going to limit each person's testimony to two minutes per person, uh, which I hope you are all prepared for since it's what we've been doing all session. Um, and we will start with testimony in support of SB 296 here in uh, Carson City. Anybody wishing to testify in support of SB 296 is invited to the table now. Thank you, Chair. John Pierre for the record from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We'd like to thank Senator Harris for bringing this measure forward. We think it builds on some of the other legislation that we've done in past sessions and takes it a little bit of a step further. Uh, and I think that it will go a long way towards reducing uh, difficult situations between law enforcement and people driving their cars. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Lilith Barron, L-A-L-I-T-H-B-A-R-A-N, the ACLU of Nevada, and in the interest of time, ditto. 
Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I want to thank the sponsor for bringing this forward and echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Thank you. It seems you interpreted that to mean two minutes total, which I like. Um, if there's anybody wishing to give support testimony on SB 296 in Las Vegas, come on up now. Not seeing anybody, we will go to the phones for support testimony on SB 296. If you would like to testify in support of SB 296, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Wiz Rosard, W-I-Z, R-O-U-Z-A-R-D, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity here in Nevada. We strongly support this bill. We believe, as others have said, not only does it build on a very important uh, foundation that we have been working on the last couple of legislative, legislative sessions, but to reaffirm what Senator Hansen said, it's important that we're talking about rebuilding trust between law enforcement and community. We must first assess as a state what responsibility we have put on law enforcement. This bill looks to correct that. It looks to ensure that law enforcement focuses and have the resources to address violent actions that makes our community less safe and making sure that the small actions such as driving or a reg unregistered vehicle is not one that prompts and take those resources from the community and deprive us taxpayers from what we expect when we are contributing to the great body of law enforcement that put their lives on the line every day. We greatly appreciate the bill sponsor in moving forward with this bill and presenting it, and we urge the committee members to support this bill. Thank you. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. We strongly support this bill, and we would like to thank Senator Harris for bringing this bill forward. Um, especially nowadays, when um, families are really suffering, um, trying to make ends meet, um, so that is a plus. It's also a benefit, and I don't think you under realize this, but it's also uh, it benefits um, uh, people who are being uh, racially profiled by traffic stops. And I also think, or we also think also, that it possibly could prevent future domestic violence from their abusers if the victim has to come home and tell the abuser that they got a ticket. So I think that is going to benefit those individuals. And the forfeiture law, uh, I want to just remind you real briefly about the uh, person, the, the retired veteran who was dry, traveling through Nevada, got pulled over by the Highway Patrol. They seized his $87,000 because of a traffic stop. Now he is in litigation against the state. So all of this, due to this um, help be prevented due to this uh, bill, uh, we strongly support it and thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Val Thomason. I'm speaking in support of SB 296. Um, a little bit over a year ago, my son was involved in a traffic stop over late registration um, that became violent, and he witnessed his father have his head shoved into a glass window. Um, it's been over a year, and he still hasn't gotten over that trauma, nor should he, because in the six years that I've known his father, a black man, I've seen him pulled over no less than 40 times every single time that he was pulled over it was for some minor citation whether that be registration brake lights or to check if he had stolen my car since he was a black man inside of a car um, and every single time that he was pulled over he went to jail i don't think that happens for the majority of people uh, but as someone who was formerly incarcerated it seems that the penalty for anything you do on the road including late registration or not having stolen a car leads to jail time. And that's just long enough, two weeks before you get your cases dismissed, to lose your house, to 
to lose your job and in some cases that I've seen to lose custody of your children. Thank you. Ian Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T. My brother Thomas Purdy was murdered by Reno Police and Washoe County Sheriff's Office during a mental health crisis. I'm calling in support of SB 296. I want to thank Senator Harris. Anytime we can prevent contact with law enforcement over petty issues is one less opportunity for someone to lose their life, be it a community member or law enforcement. Please support this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Bolaños, D-E-N-I-S-E-B-O-L-A-N-O-S, and I'm calling on behalf of Return Strong to say that we overwhelmingly support SB 296. Uh, we echo the comments of previous um, testifiers, and we hope that you'll support this bill as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Aisha Goings. Thank you, Chair A-E-S-H-A-G-O-I-N-S with the N-A-A-C-P. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Dallas Harris, for presenting this bill. Minor traffic infractions should not be used as a pretext for police to stop individuals. This practice has led to far too many instances of racial profiling and harassment, and it undermines the trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. As civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. once said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It is our duty to fight against all forms of injustice, and this bill is an important step in the right direction. We must work together to ensure that our communities are safe and free from discriminatory policies, policing practices. Thank you very much. We support this bill. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Jesse Cruz, J-E-S-S-E-C-R-U-C. I am a North Las Vegas uh, citizen, and I would like to pledge my support for Assembly Bill 296 more based on the fact that as a young driver currently in the state of Nevada, I'm 19 years old, um, I know there's definitely a lot of hesitancy when it comes to driving around in areas where I may or may not know that my back, my back left brake light is out and knowing that I could be pulled over and frightened or generally just not understand the reasons as to why after being scanned my license and things like that and being questioned by police officers about vehicle registration and other things that have to do with my vehicle that aren't even related to the reason I was stopped to in the first place. Definitely preventing things like that and allowing police officers to get to the point when it comes to pulling over young people will definitely be helpful, especially as a young Latino brown person in the community. So I pledge the committee to support Assembly Bill 296. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman, members of the committee. Uh, Will Pregman testifying on behalf of Battleborn Progress. Uh, we're ditto in support. Uh, ditto in mean, uh, comments uh, specifically from uh, Mr. Pirro and Ms. Barron uh, earlier. Thank you very much. Please support the bill. Bye. That concludes our callers for support. Sorry, I was just from you said no more callers in support. 
Um, then we will move to testimony in opposition to SB 296. Anybody wishing to give opposition test? Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like there is somebody in Las Vegas for support. Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, for the record, my name is Sean Navarro. Uh, I want to thank Senator Harris for being this bill forward. I just want to say uh, the bill that this um, kind of speaks with people will affect, um, you know, they're not bad people. They're not criminals. They're just people who are trying their best to get by. Um, I say that because I was one of these people. You know, when I first moved to Vegas, I um, had an issue where I didn't have my registration. Um, and when you're driving around and you're kind of worried about being pulled over, it's very stressful because you're just trying to, you know, survive, basically trying to go to work and go about your day without being pulled over. And um, I think, you know, it kind of, I think a lot of crime breaks down, to, or not crime, but I think a lot of the issues uh, kind of break down. These people just don't have the money. At the time, I didn't have the money for my registration. Um, so I think pulling these people over doesn't help the problem, just exacerbate, exasperates it. And um, you have people either voting, um, going to court to deal with this, or they might be, you know, uh, put in even worse situation by having to go through the, the court system. But um, thank you so much for your time and uh, ask you please support this bill. Thank you. All right. And with that, it seems we have concluded support testimony. So we'll move to testimony in opposition to SB 296. Anybody wishing to give testimony in person is invited to uh, the microphones in Carson City or Las Vegas. I don't see anybody coming to uh, the table, so we'll go to the phones for testimony in opposition to SB 296. If you would like to testify in opposition of SB 296, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers to testify in opposition. All right, then we'll go to testimony in neutral. Anybody wishing to give neutral testimony in Carson City or Las Vegas is invited to uh, the table now and go ahead whenever you're ready. Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, my name is Director Beth Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. We are in neutral on SB 296. I do want to clarify one, one statement that was made. The LVMPD did not ask for the right to stop and warn drivers for a rear light that is burned out, for a brake light that is burned out, or for missing reflectors. We did not ask to stop and warn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee. Greg Herrera for the record, H-E-R-R-E-R-A, representing Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. We are here in neutral on Senate Bill 296, I'd like to thank Senator Harris for communication, listening to our concerns, and ultimately amending the bill so we could get to this point. As a result of uh, bills, I believe it was AB 116 stemming from the last special session, session agencies across the state have begun collecting statistics that will show the demogra demographic makeup of traffic stops that are occurring from jurisdiction to jurisdiction throughout the state. The Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association is a professional organization of elected sheriffs, uh, police chiefs, and uh, other police leaders of public safety organizations in the state of Nevada. We look forward to compile, uh, compiling that data and assuring that it is consistent with our core values of compassion, integrity, accountability, fairness, professionalism, innovation, continuous improvement, diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Good afternoon, esteemed Senate Committee on the Judiciary. My name is Troy Scrumi, T-R-O. Y-C-E-K-R-U-M-M-E. -E. I am the current Vice Chairman of the Las Vegas Police Managers and Supervisors Association, also a proud member of the Public Safety Alliance of Nevada. I am testifying in neutral on SB 296 for all those bodies. I'm often asked after a critical incident when an incident doesn't end the most desirable on us, why was the initiation for the stop? And sometimes I say it's for a minor infraction and they say, well, what led to that and why did you go that? And my answer is because it's against the law and this body and ask officers to hire on, come on and enforce the law. Um, so I'm asked, well, how do we fix that? My response to lawmakers that I've had this discussion with, well, if you don't want us to make those stops, make those things not against the law anymore, and that will simplify the process. Um, I often think of a, of a phrase, the consent of the governed. Us as government agents, we can only uh, enforce laws on those that are willing to have the laws enforced. And it reminds me of a, a wise person once told me that the community should have a say-so in how they're policed. 
However, the police do not make that decision. We cannot make something legal. We cannot make something against the law. As leaders in the Las Vegas uh, Metro Police Department and officers, uh, we take pride in going out and enforcing the law. Uh, uh, supervisors take pride in motivating those officers to go out and enforce the law. And as long as there's a law on the books, officers are going to go out there and enforce those laws. So it becomes incumbent on this body to decide whether something needs to remain against the law. For that reason, the, uh, the uh, police unions are in neutral. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Scheibel, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones here on behalf of the Clark County District Attorney's Office, and we are neutral to SB 296. I do want to thank Senator Harris for meeting with us on numerous occasions with respect to this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Jeff Rogan, testifying on behalf of Clark County. Clark County has an Office of Traffic Safety whose concern is primarily ensuring the safety of all types of road users, from drivers and pedestrians to bicyclists, um, anyone who is using that road. When we first saw this bill, we had concerns that there were uh, included in the the list of offenses, certain offenses that would affect the safety of those pedestrians. And thanks to Senator Harris for working with us to remove those provisions from this bill to get us to a point where we could be neutral. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, staff. My name is Rick McCann, Nevada Association of Public Safety Officers, member of the Nevada Law Enforcement Coalition. Um, we're here neutral, technically, on SB 296. Um, frankly, I, I think neutral sucks. <coughs> Um, I don't like neutral, but I got people on both sides of the story that say, I like it, I don't like it, so we're here in neutral. Uh, but I will make this editorial comment. Um, the extent to which we need to legislate uh, that these violations should not be used as a sole reason to pull over people, uh, we see this as a positive effort in that respect. That's all I'm going to say. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair members of the committee, I'm John Abel, a Director of Governmental Affairs for the LVPPA. I want to thank Senator Harris for including us in this bill from the very beginning. And I'm going to ditto everything that Rick McCann and Troy Scrimi say and testify neutral. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's go to, uh, I don't see anybody in Las Vegas for the record coming to the table, so we'll go to the phones for testimony in neutral on SB 296. you like to testify in neutral for SB 296, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Hello, my name is Jovan Jackson, resident of North Las Vegas. Uh, I'm actually in support of this bill. Um, I know in last session, AD 116 was passed to decriminalize uh, minor traffic citations. Uh, if you ask any police officer, they, they'll let you know they do not handle civil issues. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these things that we're hearing about broken taillights and uh, not having a license plate in the right place sounds more like civil issues than criminal issues. So I'm in support of this legislation. Thank you. And Secretary, if we could just have um, it reflected in the minutes that he, that caller was in support. Thank you. There are no further callers to testify in neutral. All right, then that brings us to the conclusion of our testimony on SB 296. I will invite the sponsors back up to make any closing comments. Thank you, Chair, uh, members of the committee. I really appreciate you all taking the time to hear Senate Bill 296 today. Um, I will, I will clarify the record, I put in the request to allow officers to stop for those uh, equipment um, infractions and give a warning um, that was a, a choice of the sponsor um, I hope y'all hear that we have done a lot of work on this bill uh, and have gotten to a place where uh, most if not all folks who are involved think that this policy makes sense uh, and so I'm hoping that we can bring the the committee and uh, this body along with us Ms. Mosley, closing comments? Lisa Mosley, sales for the record. I would just like to uh, 
support what Senator Harris just said. This legislation does make sense. It makes sense for the way that Nevada is going. Um, it's with our reforms, uh, particularly around AB um, 116 last session. And it just makes sense for the way we want our state to go. And so protecting our communities, protecting our officers, to me, makes sense. So I am happy to, again, be supporting this legislation, would urge the committee to support it as well. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. And did you have any closing comments? Okay. <laughs> um, and that concludes our hearing on SB 296. I will now open the hearing on SB 307 and invite our presenters to the front table to begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and committee members. I am Pat Spearman and I represent Senate District 1 in North Las Vegas and I'm here today to present Senate Bill 306, 307. This bill requires the Director of the Nevada Department of Corrections to adopt regulations governing the use of solitary confinement and to bring Nevada in line with the Mandela Rules. The spirit of the bill is ba based on the Mandela Rules, which, na which was named in honor <clears throat> of the South Africa president who spent 27 years in prison because, he's, because of his fight against apartheid. The rules were created in 2015 by the United Nations Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Rule number 43 states, in no circumstances may restrictions or disciplinary sanctions amount to torture or other cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. The following policies, <clears throat> the following practices in particular should be prohibited. Indefinite solitary confinement, prolonged solitary confinement, placement of a prisoner, prisoner in a dark or constantly lit cell, corporal punishment or the reduction of a pr prisoner's diet of drinking water, and collective punishment. So we're here today to make sure that the Nevada statutes fall in line with uh, the Mandela rules. And I'm just going to go over um, the summary very briefly, and then I'll uh, turn it over um, to my more astute um, colleagues on my left and my right. Um, the bill requires the director of NDOC to adopt regulations to ensure that all solitary confinement may only be used, one, as a last resort when the offender must be separated from the general population in a secure environment in the least restrictive manner and for the shortest period of time safely possible. The bill also requires new regulations to be adopted that prohibit the use of disciplinary segregation for vulnerable offenders. Vulnerable offenders are prisoners with a serious mental illness or mental impairment. And Madam Chair, if I might at this time, uh, when I chaired Health and Human Services, and I believe it was 2017, uh, and Director Zrenda came to testify, um, I think I remember him saying that when he arrived, there were five, and if I'm incorrect, he can correct it when he comes up, there were five severely mentally ill patients who had been in solitary confinement for a, an extended amount of time. I think I got that right. <clears throat> This type of segregation of prisoners especially is especially detrimental to those with mental illnesses. And we're not, doing, we're not doing any justice by them by forcing them into this kind of a situation. But we are also virtually ensuring that their mental health will suffer from this treatment. In addition, this bill creates new regulations. One, to review and make certain evaluations relating to the use of solitary confinement. Two, provide access to programming for offenders in solitary confinement. Three, require certain training for staff who are placed in solitary confinement. And four, establish minimum requirements, reviews, and various procedures. Lastly, the bill removes the provisions relating to the length of stay in disciplinary segregation and instead limits the maximum number of consecutive days to 15. I'll now turn it over to Nick Shepak to go through the bill and the proposed amendment. 
Thank you, Chair and committee members. My name is Nick Shepak. Uh, today I am here as a steering committee member of Social Workers Against Solitary Confinement, a national organization, as well as board chair of Return Strong and somebody who has, over the recent years, become very intimately acquainted with solitary confinement and, and many solitary survivors. Um, the amendment you have before you was created in conjunction uh, with Director Zurenda from the Nevada Department of Corrections. And uh, in his testimony, I believe he will explain that um, while this is not a physical committee, that, that this can be done at no cost to the state. Prior to Director Zurenda leaving the Nevada Department of Corrections, we were moving in the right direction. Uh, the director had asked the Vera Institute to come in. There were recommendations given. Those recommendations were not implemented. If you remember last session when we were here, um, for those of you who sat on this committee, we had Mr. Frank De Palma come and testify. Uh, we were virtual at the time. Frank De Palma did 22 years and 36 days, consecutive days, in solitary confinement in the Nevada Department of Corrections. He's now a resident of Reno. He is a dear friend of mine, and the impact of solitary confinement is extremely clear. His, while he is an extreme example, it is not as unique as you might think. What we have before us in this amendment is a huge step for Nevada to move towards following the Mandela rules and to ensure that nobody spends that amount of time in solitary confinement. Um, I will walk us through the sections of the bill as amendment, and I will hand it over to Lily Barron from the ACLU. Um, so section two simply defines solitary confinement as any time that is somebody is in a cell for 22 or more consecutive hours. Uh, section three, uh, as the senator stated, requires solitary to be used as a last resort as a last resort, the least restrictive means, and for the shortest period of time possible. Uh, section four sets out that there, uh, solitary may not be used from, for more than 15 consecutive days. Uh, section five uh, explains that af at the 15th day, there must be, the m person must be taken out of solitary, there must be a review, um, and that review must come with recommendations for programming, housing and mental health referrals. Section six implements a multidisciplinary team consisting of a psychologist, social worker, uh, correction supervisor, and an assistant warden to assess the individual. Uh, section seven uh, creates provisions that allow the disciplinary team under very specific circumstances uh, to make a recommendation to place a person um, back in solitary for a period of time uh, if it is necessary for their safety. Uh, section eight ensures that nobody is placed in solitary within 90 days of release. A major problem we have seen across the country is people go straight from solitary to the community. Uh, this transition is uh, often nearly impossible. Uh, section nine ensures that uh, offenders with severe mental illness are not ever placed in solitary confinement. There's a saying in the solitary survivor community that if you did not have a mental illness when you went into solitary, you came out with one. When we place people with severe mental illness in solitary confinement, countless studies show that it exacerbates that mental illness. Um, this hinders rehabilitation. Uh, section 10, um, section 10 allows a, a medical or mental health clinician uh, m requires them to tour the houses uh, at least every 24 hours to uh, make sure that everything is okay and assess these individuals. I will quickly state that I had the opportunity in 2018 to stand on the solitary unit at Ely State Prison and I've never heard anything like that. Screams, banging, begging for help. Um, the cacophony, the noise was, was overwhelming, um, and, and you can only imagine what that would do to somebody uh, if they were held there for a long period of time. Uh, section 11 requires all staff who work in solitary units to have training in effective communication, crisis intervention, and de-escalation techniques. Uh, section 12 uh, ensures that communication with a family is not completely removed for individuals who are held in these conditions. 
uh, through phone or visits. Uh, section 13 ensures that mail is never taken away as a disciplinary sanction and that that is given to people even while they are held in solitary. And finally, uh, we have, um, at the request of the director, moved the uh, effective date back to the beginning of next year and so that all of this may be accomplished uh, within that time frame. Before I briefly pass it over, I just want to mention one more statistic. Um, this is not a unique movement in Nevada. 46 states have introduced 956 bills to deal with this. 176 of them have passed in 41 different states. Uh, I will remind everyone that this passed unanimously and bipartisanly out of committee uh, last session. And uh, there was a very large fiscal note on it. And we were not able to get over that hurdle uh, last time, but we think we're there now, and I will pass it over to my colleague from the ACLU. Thank you so much, Chair and members of the committee, and Lilith Barron from the ACLU of Nevada. Um, I, I just want to briefly thank the Senator and Mr. Sheepak for their extensive work on this issue. Um, I will say that we spend an incredible amount of resources and time on this. However, um, these two have spent years on this issue. I'm just very happy to be next to them here to finally pass this bill. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about why this is important and some of the effects in a little bit um, so that we can get a full picture. So solitary confinement is one of the most consistently researched um, prison policies and practices. This is extremely researched because of the effects that it has on the community. Um, this Research has overwhelmingly displayed that solitary confinement, as you've heard from my colleagues, takes an immense toll on a person's mental, emotional, and physical well-being. It causes irreversible neurological damage, and that is across the board. Researchers agree with that. And it's because human beings must have meaningful connections in order to survive and thrive. That is what makes us all similar, right? None of us are able to live completely alone without any uh, meaningful connection. Those confined in solitary are far more likely to suffer from heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, and loneliness. And even returning to the outside community, uh, past time spent in solitary leads people to have higher rates of death, including from suicide, homicide, and drug overdose. Um, people who spend even a few days in solitary confinement are also, after release, more likely to die by accident, suicide, violence and the recidivism rates are horrific. Um, the Lehman Center at Yale University published a report entitled Time in a Cell, a 2021 snapshot of restrictive housing based on a nationwide survey of US prison systems. And here are some of the numbers that they came up with. Between 2018 and 2020, when the last report was published, legislators in more than 25 states introduced these bills. Um, the report provides an update of the bills, the resolutions, and executive orders introduced and enacted in all of these states. I'm happy to provide that for you. However, we're kind of in crunch time, so we didn't really have the time to submit those things. Um, in Nevada, um, according to this study, we had 1,059 people in restrictive housing, accounting for 10.1% of the incarcerated population at NDOC, and 193 of those people have been in restricted housing for more than a year. 23 people for three to six years, 16 people for six to 10 years, 57 people for more than 10 years. This is self-reported data from the Department of Corrections. Um, 387 people are in restrictive housing for administrative reasons, 230 for safety, 99 for punishment, 274 for personal choice. Um, to expand on that, um, the effects of solitary sometimes will cause the individual to feel uncomfortable around other individuals after such an extreme period of isolation. They're often more jumpy, scared of uh, the sound of keys, slamming doors, things like that, because they've experienced such extreme trauma. 40% um, of transgender identified prisoners are in restrictive housing or solitary confinement. And 146 people in restrictive housing are over 50 years old. So I am very happy that we are working with Director Zorinda on all of these incredible issues um, and that this legislation will bring us to the standards deemed appropriate by the United Nations, standard minimum rules, um, as Senator Spearman mentioned. 
And I guess in closing, I would just like to say that we've had the opportunity to spend some really intimate time with some of these folks. And one of the things that I think about often when spending time with them is how incredible a person must be after experiencing such torture. And once they're finally released, they have the choice to go and live the rest of their lives. And I don't think anyone would blame them for that. But this experience was so horrific to them that they've continued to dedicate the rest of their lives to helping end this practice when they could just go and live the rest of their lives that they have. And I think that that's really a testament to how incredibly important this issue is to people who are both survivors and folks that work with survivors. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I just want to close this portion of my presentation um, by reminding everyone of Khalif uh, Browder. Uh, you may remember he was a young man who was accused, never had a trial, but he was accused of stealing a backpack. He spent in Rikers Island Jail Complex 2010 to 2013 for allegedly stealing a backpack containing valuables. During his imprisonment, Browder was in solitary confinement, hang on to your wig, girls grab your pearls, 700 days. And very soon after his relief, release, he completed suicide. This is a very dangerous practice. If we don't get a handle on it, it's not just dangerous for the people who are in solitary confinement. I think that it's, it's dangerous for us as a society because it would show our inhumanity to humanity. And so with that, um, we're finished with presenting and ready for either questions or um, stepping back. All right, let's see, are there any questions? Senator Harris. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Not a question, more of a comment, and that is solitary confinement sucks. And um, I know all of us, <clears throat> the whole world went through the COVID experience today and we're going stir crazy in our own homes, our thousand foot plus potentially square foot homes. Uh, it's almost like people who are in solitary confinement live under uh, COVID protocols, uh, 24 seven. And so, you know, I'm hoping people can be sympathetic to that idea and really take a portion of what, what we all experienced when we weren't able to go outside, um, and apply that to what folks might be experiencing. Although just, I don't know, a hundred times worse. Thank you, chair. Uh, Senator Orenshaw. Thank you very much, Chair. I think I'm following Senator Harris's lead here with a little bit more of a comment, but I really appreciate the bill. And, you know, it's hard to imagine that, you know, we need legislation like this in this day and age. When I think of solitary confinement, I think of, you know, the news reports when I was a kid growing up uh, from the Soviet Union and how prisoners were treated there. And I understand that, uh, you know, we've made great strides thanks to the hard work of ACLU and other organizations, and I appreciate the bill because I think it takes us even further in having this be, you know, only when it's absolutely deemed necessary, uh, you know, for the, the safety of that, that person. So I really appreciate the bill. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. How much of this mirrors current federal law? Nick Sheepak, for the record, Current federal law does not currently meet the Mandela standards. So how much of this is based on federal law? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. The, the director may. This, um, these time limits mirror both the Mandela standards and what we see uh, happening across the country, Colorado, New York, um, states that have dealt with this. Thank you. Well, the reason I brought that up, and there's a comment here. Are you familiar with the capes of uh, Jacob Chansley? You might know him as Quantum Shaman. He was the guy that was accused in the January 6th uh, uh, riot that just spent 11 months in solitary confinement and was released after the expul uh, exculpatory evidence of the, of the videos were released. So, you know, I think that while I'm completely supportive of the concepts behind this, I think we better recognize that there are people that are still being, not in the Soviet Union anymore, but right here in America who are denied exculpatory evidence 
And then when the whole country got to see that the guy was being escorted into the building by the police, was removed from solitary confinement and released after 11 months in America, not the Soviet Union. So I, I'm completely in agreement. Those kind of things are inhumane, but that's not occurring a 1,000 years ago. That's occurring right now under the current administration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you all for your presentation. We will move to testimony in support of SB 307. Um, each person wishing to give testimony will have two minutes to speak, and you are uh, welcome and encouraged to say ditto or that you echo the comments of a previous speaker if, um, in fact, they do reflect your views as well. So please go ahead whenever you're ready here in Carson City. Lisa Foley, F-O-L-E-Y. There's a new book out called <clears throat> What's Prison For? And the author, Bill Keller, states, human kindness is a big part of rehabilitation. I have found it meaningful to put extra kindness in my life by corresponding regularly with a stranger, a woman at Florence McClure Correctional Center, who soon after I began writing with her was assigned to correctional, uh, sorry, to solitary confinement. Um, during the COVID period, she was segregated for over 110 days. Her letters over the period I, I know her have shown real mental deterioration. Yes, she dwelled on suicide and mentioned that other women nearby her cell had succeeded in committing suicide. Towards the end of her stint, she wrote letters to me about devils taking over her, her body. And so now I'm going to read for you uh, a short excerpt that she wrote two years ago uh, when the ACLU was uh, soliciting uh, testimony for a story uh, book thing online that she submitted back then. And when she was, she wrote these from solitary confinement. This is her quote. Feeling alone in prison, hopeless and helpless is a way of life. I was brought to solitary confinement and charged with a major infraction, possession of a piece of paper containing numbers on it. It was said to be paraphernalia. I asked them to test it and was told they didn't have the proper equipment to test the substance. I told them to drug test me and without doubt I passed. The administrative regs say, state that they have a 30 days maximum to sanction us. However, I sat in solitary confinement for 92 days before I was sanctioned. Then as my punishment, I was given an additional 30 days in the hole. Depression is real when you're locked in a room 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no library. All you can do to, is worry and stress until your mind can't take it, so you try to sleep the days away. Solitary confinement is not meant to be used as a form of punishment, but it is in every way. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ayana, A-Y-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S, -M -M -O Oglesby, O-G-L-E-S-B-Y, and I support this bill, and I stand in proxy with all the organizations here. I would like to say I have a firsthand experience of someone being released out of solitary confinement. My brother Zach, person incarcerated 77866. He did four years in the hole in Ely. And he's been released several times. He's you know violated all the times, but in conversations, he accused our second grade teacher of being our biological mother. Um, he was in the car when President Kennedy got shot. Um, he has a lot of things going on in his mind, and he did not go to prison in that matter. My concern, um, the strong urge and necessity for this is because as a community, you know, we see them and we're judgmental because they're walking around, they're talking to themselves, and everybody automatically assumes they're on drugs not even understanding or realizing that they have been mentally tortured, abused, and purposely turned and created into a monster. 
and then released back to society and expected to function and do well. I say this because a lot of those people are at the officer's discretion when they go to the hole. Now, they can be humane and punish them for whatever it is they did, but because they're already considered criminals, we have to treat them even worse than criminals. You chain a dog, you go to jail. You mistreat an animal, you go to jail. But yet, it's ethical for us to treat other human beings in this matter. My brother is one of many in my community. Everyone I know that has been to prison, now I'll be 50 years old next month. The first person, my eldest brother, was direct filed when he was 17, when I was nine years old in Indian Springs, Nevada. He came home okay, but he's one of few. Everyone else at the officer's discretion that ends up in the hole, that none of them come out the same, and then they're back into our communities, and then they're back in prison. So it's a revolving door, so when the officers drop them off at PNP and say, see you when you get back, they know they're coming back because they're destroyed. They're not always on drugs. So the feces on the wall, the, 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 the screaming, the inability to properly and effectively communicate happens in that darkness because they're not out for 22 hours. They're not in for just 22 hours. This is consistent around the clock. They don't get a break. They don't get that air. That's for the regular tier time people. So with that being said, I would ask you guys to strongly consider this because, again, we're Nevada strong and we're battle born. And we have a moral obligation to all Nevadans. And it's unethical. And if you don't believe us, those of us that has and know, go look for yourselves. Now, I know we have a different director and things are changing, but go and see it for yourself if you don't believe us. It's horrific and it's monstrous. And the mental health it should be mandated, but that's another fight. And I'm going to rest my case, but I, I really strongly and urge you guys to strongly consider this. It's, it's necessary for us as a community, as a whole, for our state. Thank you. My name is Dr. Karen Gedney um, and esteemed board. I was the senior physician for the Nevada Department of Corrections for 30 years. And I am a internal medicine specialist. I also had the ability to watch men for 30 years. And I saw <clears throat> the dilemma of solitary confinement, which I was never trained for in medical school. The majority of individuals that end up in solitary have psychological problems, problems with anger control, are not socialized well, and they are the ones who don't have the wherewithal to sometimes keep themselves out of trouble. And they are put in an environment, solitary, which breaks down their psychological minds horribly. And I left the prison in 2017, and I'm still concerned about the prison, and that's why I'm here. And this has to be done, where you have to get into the right century. Thank you. My name is William Connors. I spent 22 years in uh, uh, Nevada Department of Corrections. Um, I did uh, five months in solitary confinement because uh, they thought I did something wrong, <laughs> and I didn't. And uh, uh, they thought I had uh, sexual intercourse with another man, and it was brought about by a Priya kite that was sent on me. So they put me in there, they took uh, blood from me, and uh, over five months uh, they didn't care about my rights or for me or anything like that. And then after five months, they just let me back into population like nothing happened. And I wanted you to understand that this stuff goes on all the time. 
and, and they just don't care uh, at all about you or what you're doing because you're a prisoner and your rights are negated. Uh, they, just, they just don't care. They really don't. And uh, that should be stopped. Uh, there should be some people in the way to say, okay, why did he do this? And let's see if we can uh, mitigate this before he uh, goes into there or something else. But I don't know what can be done, but I'm hoping that this bill will pass and we'll get that done. And uh, we won't get that because uh, I, don't wanna, I didn't want to go through it and I don't want anybody else to go through it. So thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Jody Hawking. I am the founder and executive director of Return Strong. As you know, we work um, with incarcerated people and their families. I'm just going to apologize. I'm, I feel like super overwhelmed right now, and my mind is going a million different things that I have two minutes to say. But um, when we switch to Vegas, you're going to hear from a group of people who are solitary survivors. Um, those people are not the worst of the worst. Some of them were teenagers. They were 16 and 17 years old when they went to prison and spent the first five years of their incarceration in solitary confinement because they were rebellious. They were direct filed into an adult system and expected to just comply. Um, these people are really the heart and soul of why we're here. I think one of the things that has really been um, impressed on me is how many preconceived notions that we have around solitary. The reason that it happens, which I always thought it was like Hannibal Lecter, Jeffrey Dahmer, those were the people that were in solitary, but really it's like all the people that you're gonna hear from in a few minutes that are now in our communities and working and trying to get their, put their lives back together. They were the people who spent, were kept in cages in urine-soaked rooms without blankets and cleaning supplies. Some of them were teenagers when they were locked in those cages. They're strip searched before they're shackled and handcuffed to go to showers. We remove them even from prison populations for things like, I recently had somebody who had contraband. You know what the contraband was? Butter. They had butter from the chow hall. And so they went to the hole for that. Um, somebody had a pair of jeans that wasn't theirs. Somebody had given them when they left prison and didn't have their number on it, they went to solitary. I think the ideas behind why these things happen is that as a community, we assume that it is these horrific things. And sometimes it is, sometimes it is horrific things. Sometimes it's people who need more restriction, but that's not the vast majority of people. I want to just quickly, I don't know where I am, read a statement from somebody who's spent years, decades in solitary confinement in Nevada. He says, I was in a cell for 23 to 24 hours a day. After only a few months, I cut off everyone that I know, family, friends, lawyers, and I even became unresponsive to prison staff. I crawled into, my, into myself because isolation can do this. I quit showering, shaving, caring about any hygiene, including brushing my teeth. Nothing mattered anymore. I lost all track of time. I was disoriented, and all that I was offered was medication. If I was, or I was asked if I was feeling suicidal. Most definitely a play that would permit the confiscation of the rest of my clothes and leave me naked in the freezing cage or cell. I wasn't interested in that. Each passing day pushed me deeper and deeper into the ab abysmal pit when you're on the brink of sanity leaving you, there's no true self-awareness to what's happening. Autopilot rules the days as they arrive. I was vulnerable beyond measure, agonizingly paranoid, and an under, is an understatement to what I became. Simplistically, the effects of solitary confinement psychologically tell are real, and they generally last for a lifetime, especially when the effects are slowly and constantly being fed the conditions that created them. The value question again, do we care enough about humanity and other people to either fight the tip of the iceberg or fit the, fight the root of the problem? 
you guys are going to hear me say it a million times this session, is this is an opportunity for us to start fighting the root of the problem and stop fighting the tip of the iceberg, butter, talking back, those types of things. Thank you. Oh, we're in support. I'm in support. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to turn my mic. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Erica Roth on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I'll keep my um, comments short because I want to make sure that those who are impacted have their voices centered in this conversation. And so I'll just briefly add this. I believe it was this committee when I heard one of our esteemed senators state that love is the answer. And in this case, I think that compassion is the answer. Um, we are not the sum of our worst decisions, and no one deserves to be treated in this manner. And so with that, I want to thank the bill sponsor, and I will pass the mic. Thank you. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We're in strong support of this measure. Uh, how we treat somebody while they're in will directly affect how they come out. Uh, the better that we treat them, the less that we treat them like animals, the more they can reintegrate into society uh, and the rehabilitative aspect of that afterwards means a ton. Cost savings for our community, but also public safety. Uh, so we strongly support this measure and urge your support. Thank you. Anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support? <clears throat> okay, we'll go ahead and head down to Las Vegas. Uh, please remember to state your name for the record when you speak. Hello, my name is Christine Essex, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-E-S-S-E-X, -S -S -E and I am supportive of the bill, uh, SB 307. I feel that extensive solitaire is inhumane and causes diminished hope and uncertainty as to when they will get out and what's happening outside with their families. Their mental capacity becomes unstable and they are fearful to even ask for help. It also puts them into a sense of hopelessness. My son Adam stopped caring about his future and his music in sol well, and sentenced in solitary. He gave up creating songs and his goals as well as his passions. His limited ability to call while in solitary left him uh, distant and isolated from all of us. His limited ability to, uh, I just said that, okay, which, which left us unable to support him and encourage him when he needed it the most. Shorter terms would or could support a person and family to stay connected. Please consider making these solitary sentences appropriate to the violations. My other son, I have two sons incarcerated. My other son who has a brain damage and is disabled disabled would not be do well at all in solitary at all. He has, um, it is my hope and concerns that he never happens this never happens while he's in custody. He has to have the ability to speak to me as I am his voice, his caregiver, and his legal guardian since 2017. He's highly dependent on proper guidance and understanding. I am, um, in my son's case, in this son's case, Richard, uh, he does not have mental illness. He has anoxic brain damage. So that, uh, this bill, I would just let, hope that it would include that as well and it affects his cognitive abilities and challenges limited to social abilities. I mean, it's difficult for him. Also, please consider the medical needs of uh, people that are being placed in solitary confinement, like seizures, depression, and anxiety issues. So that's what I would like to say um, at this time and how I'm impacted as a family. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Copeland, A-N-G-E-L-A-C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D. I'm here with Return Strong to read a letter that was submitted to us by a person who is formally incarcerated and is working today. I'll be reading his statement and expressing support for this important legislation on both of our behalfs. I'm John Williams, formally incarcerated. I started my sentence as a juvenile and spent a lot of time in solitary confinement for mostly minor infractions. Two years is the most I did at a single time. For me, the most disturbing aspect of prolonged isolation is the impairment of my social skills, which still affect me to this day. Since my return to society, I've drawn a direct link between my social readjustment and solitary confinement. Whenever I'd get out of the hole, I'd have to readjust to the general population. 
and I've gone through the same social process in society. Prolonged isolation is counterproductive to rehabilitation and reentry. According to statistics published by Unlock the Box, a national coalition of organizations working to end the practice of solitary confinement, 85% of people in solitary confinement are there for nonviolent disciplinary violations, as John mentions. Things like talking back to an officer, having contraband, which in one case we were given was butter from the chow hall, misuse of a phone that didn't have illegal activity. As a citizen, I believe that solitary confinement was for the worst of the worst violent offenses. In my mind, just as mentioned earlier, Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, not for John Williams or Moses Cortez or Tonico Smith or Phil Minor, people who entered an adult system as teenagers and were working through dealing with incarceration as young adults with the normal angst kids have amplified by being in prison. Now, every one of them is back in society and living as survivors of harm inflicted by our prison system. Each of them spent years in prison. We must do better. Myself and John are in support of SB 307. Thank you, Senator Spearman, for your courage in taking on this fight and for the committee in hearing this bill. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Covello, K-O-V-E-L-L-O. -L -L I am an activist with Return Strong and the parent of a formerly incarcerated person. I read all the letters that come in and have been a pen pal to some of the women who are incarcerated with being, uh, being with Return Strong. I wish you could come read those letters for a day. Before my son was incarcerated, I believe that prison was about helping people get their lives on track and being accountable for the mistakes that they made. I don't believe that anymore. Today I'm gonna to share with you part of a letter from one of the women that we work with at Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center. She was in solitary confinement for her first ever write-up after doing a significant amount of time. Uh, the write-up was for contraband, which was a tool that she had made to do hobby craft, which was taken away from her during COVID. Um, I'm, and as I said, I'm a pen pal with this particular person. Here are her words. I'm writing about the extensive punishment I'm still going through here at Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center. On May 15, 2021, I was taken to segregation and I stayed in segregation until July 7th of 2021, when after 53 days, I was finally sanctioned and sentenced to an additional 60 days. I ended up doing a total of 80, 83 days in segregation. I was literally losing my mind. We have no library, the phones are broken. The windows are tinted so dark that we cannot even see outside at all. We showered every other day for 10 minutes. The CEO in that unit was rude to me. I'm a strong woman, but I thought about killing myself many times. Locked in that cell alone with only my mattress and my white clothes. When they rolled me up, they unauthorized all my hygiene because they said they had no room to fit it in my box. I was given state shampoo and a bar of lye soap. The AR states that there's a maximum stay of 30 days in the VMU today. Seven months later, I'm still here waiting to take a class as required to go back to the general population. I have not gotten into any trouble at all. I sent a kite to the caseworker and got no response. It's been nine days and a few days total that I've been being punished for my first ever write-up. I'm losing days. I'm losing my mind. The experience is the worst thing that I've ever experienced in my life in segregation in a women's prison. We do not receive canteen at all. We can't get access or buy food or hygiene. We're only allowed to get toothpaste, stamps, paper deodorant, and tampons. Also, a girl in a psych housing hung herself, and the CEO didn't even find her until eight hours later. Rigor mortis had already kicked in, and I was witness to two other women attempting to kill themselves. Women should not be locked in a room like that long. Please help us. Sincerely, BC. I am in support of SB 307, and now I'd like to turn this over to Morse, uh, Moises Cortez here. 
Um, I, I was, my name is Moises Cortez and I was formerly incarcerated and a survivor of uh, solitary confinement. I did uh, 11 and a half years and out of uh, those years, I did eight of them in solitary confinement. I was uh, in solitary confinement straight from when I was 18 to 23. And I think that affected me my growing because I don't think, I believe now that you don't, you don't uh, mentally grow until you're older. So that time that I spent in uh, solitary confinement is when I was a teenager turning to an adult. And even though it helped me a lot to grow as a man, it, it did affect me a lot. And I don't realize how much it affected me till I got out. And my people told me how much it affected me. Because me, by myself, I'm not going to notice the difference. But when other people tell you you're different, that's when you notice that it affected you. That's all I got to say. Thank you. I support the bill. I'm Destiny Rich, and I am a former inmate at Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center and a survivor of solitary confinement. When you are isolated by the restraint of a system, you find comfort in being alone, which means socializing with other people becomes uncomfortable. Being around other people becomes uncomfortable. When people feel uncomfortable, they are more alert more prone to aggressive behavior, less receptive, and less acceptable to feedback. There is a lack of communication and a lack of subject to public opinion from other inmates. As a result, you have the same behavior, but you learn how to keep it internal until it's not. And that is exactly what it did to me. I still struggle in finding comfort around people. I tend to isolate when I need to communicate and address the emotions that I am having. Solitary confinement contradicts a healthy lifestyle. At FMWCC, when you hear institutional lockdown, it means to go to your bed. This means no shower, no phone calls, no programming, no going outside, no microwaves, and no kiosk. Institutional lockdowns, to me, were still a form of solitary confinement, but justified in their inability to run the facility. Institutional lockdowns to me is solitary confinement because these doors are shut, restrictions still apply, and I still lost my days. Institutional lockdown applies to every inmate at the facility, regardless of how good your behavior is. Therefore, I am here to support SB 307. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Philip Minor. Um, I spent 37 years in prison from the time I was 19 to the time I was 56. Um, of those 37 years, I spent about 12 of them in solitary confinement for various different things. Um, three and a half years at, uh, at once, at one point in time, another three at another point in time, and then, you know, various increments of a year here, a year there, and stuff like that. What I can tell you from firsthand experience is that during solitary confinement, anything, first of all, you're already in prison, so you're already dealing with, you know, failure in life, um, um, loss of your freedom, uh, uh, feelings of, 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 of helplessness, of being able to, you know, have any kind of control of your life anymore. So you're already dealing with that. Then you go to solitary confinement, and so you have no choice but for 24 hours a day to sit and dwell in, in, in your problems and depression and your inability to affect anything outside of yourself if you have your family is going through problems. So say, for instance, you have a son or a mother or a parent or somebody that's dealing with issues on the street or that's sick or something like that. You sit in prison, you sit in a cell, and you can't do anything about it. So you sit and you dwell and you become depressed and things of that nature. But I think um, you probably already know about the emotional aspects of it, but at the same time, 
it also interferes with your ability to do anything constructive with your time. You sit back here, you can't do anything. You can't, you can't, there's no positive reinforcement for any, any ideas that you may have. You know, it helps you if you have, if you've already failed in life and you try, you want to try to rise above that and try to do something positive. Other people around you encouraging you and, and pushing you to, 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 to do better and to, and to go in a more positive direction, it helps you. But when you're in a hole, you don't have any of that. So you sit there, you can't, then you become more depressed, more angry because you can't do anything constructive or beneficial with your time. So you sit sitting there and, 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 and basically you have no choice but to dwell in a kind of depression and a kind of darkness. And then you end up getting out the hole with that. So uh, I support the bill because anything that, you know, eliminates that kind of situation, then you also have to realize that these same people, you know what I'm saying, get out of prison and then they're dealing with other people on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not just a situation that affects the individual. It affects every person that that individual comes into contact with, you know, once they leave prison. So uh, as a result, I, I support the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Gaddis, and I want, first of all, to thank Senator Spearman for bringing this bill again. Um, I have been formerly incarcerated in Nevada, and I'm here today to support the bill. I agree with the need for oversight to the disciplinary process, including the use of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement has been used and abused historically by COs and lieutenants. I am not a problematic offender, let alone violent or combat combative. I always have had a job or in some sort of program. To be, to be clear here, at the time I went to the hole, I have been incarcerated one and a half years with no write-ups, was in a program of seeking safety and CSN college. I was called at 5 a.m. to the gym where random UAs were being conducted. I provided a small amount of urine in which the CO dumped my urine out saying that it wasn't enough. I waited to try again and could not produce any more at that time. I was immediately rolled up and taken to the hole. The write-up was for failing to give a UA sample, in which that was not true. I waited two weeks for my write-up to be read to me, another three weeks to plea, and then another two weeks to get sanctioned, which was a 30-day sanction on top of that, on to, plus a week of commissary restriction. Um, I had to wait for the behavioral unit to take a required class in order to complete my sanction, Clearly, I lost my CSN and other programming as well. This process took about 75 to 80 days. I did not do anything wrong here, and to have been treated like an animal back there is unacceptable. The staff that are, that are assigned to these units are anything except professional. I was even told by an officer that, that they do not work in a professional environment, so they don't need to be professional. And that might very well be true. However, I'm sure it's not in their job description to disrespect demoralize and deprive offenders. I also want to be honest about this experience. It did not make me sad. It actually caused me to be resentful and bitter. I did have a different attitude when I was released from solitary and it was an attitude and belief that I carried around for a long time. Yes, things became difficult for me because I no longer trusted in the process and theory that as long as you do nothing, you have nothing to worry about. I lost all around the board, even becoming ineligible for camp because of my points being raised. It took another year for my points to drop. At that time, I went into the COVID lockdown, coming out of our cells 15 minutes every three days. I feel that this bill, if I feel that if this bill were passed, it would give the oversight needed to address the use and abuse that is happening with solitary confinement today. I encourage the training of all staff, but especially for those that are assigned to disciplinary units. I'm confident that with the director being responsible to enforce this bill, if passed, he will do so accordingly and do his best to make sure this process is not abused. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Figueroa. I am in support of SB 307, and thank you, Senator Spearman, for bringing this to the table. I am currently going to read a statement for another member who had to leave to go back to work. Um, her name is Marianne Espinoza, E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A. My last name again for the record is Figueroa, F-I-G-U-E-R-O-A. Uh, she says, my name is Marianne Espinoza. 
I am writing this in support of SB 307. I currently have a husband and two sons incarcerated in Nevada Department of Corrections. My husband is currently serving 60 days in disciplinary segregation. This segregation has affected his mental health issues. Prior to this time, both my husband and sons were affected by all the lockdowns, not being allowed to go out to rec yard, shower, use the phones, being stuck in their cells for days, sometimes weeks at a time. All of that affects even a person that doesn't have mental health issues. Even though they are incarcerated, doesn't mean they need to be locked in a cell 24 hours a day. Not getting a vitamin D from the sun or being around others. They need to be around others in order to be able to come home and not have fear of being in places with large crowds as I have seen in my oldest son back in 2019 when he came home from prison and had an anxiety attack from all the people at the DMV. When we went to get his driver's license, he had an anxiety attack. I know that you may think it's nothing, but it's hurting all our loved ones who have been in any segregation for long periods of time. This needs to change for the better better of not only our loved ones, but the staff of each facility because all the segregation makes them act out towards the officers. Thank you for your time. And sincerely, Marian Espinoza. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sabrina Torres, S-A-B-R-I-N-A. T-O-R-R-E-S. I am here as an activist for Return Strong, and I'm also going to be reading something from somebody who had to leave a little bit early today. Um, to whom it may concern, my name is Tina Turrentine, T-I-N-A-T-U-R-E-N-T-I-N-E. -E. And my loved one, is located at High Desert State Prison. I have seen firsthand the effects of long-term solitary confinement on our loved ones. My loved one has already has consistently been locked down for numerous days at a time, regularly at the facility he's currently located. It is disheartening and ridiculous that these lockdowns occur, let alone the length of the solitary confinement. The lack of food, sunlight, human communication are just a few of the things that they endure during that time. Not only does it take a toll on him, but it takes a toll on us families, constantly worrying about their well-being and having to question if they're okay when we are not as well due to the lack of communication. Questions as, did he eat today? Did he get to shower today? Did he get some fresh air and enjoy the sunlight instead of being in a dark room with no human contact? The state is always talking about how they want reform. How is this going to make things better? This is going to make things worse. Um, we have to do better for our loved ones. I'm in full support of SB 307. Thank you, Tina Turrentine. And myself, Sabrina, is also in support. Thank you. My name is Sonia Williams, S-O-N-Y-A-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Um, I am here today to read a letter from one of our families who asked that we read it because they had to work. Um, she said, or this is quoted from her letter directly. My name is Estee Paget, and my loved one is located at SDCC. I've seen firsthand the effects of long-term solitary confinement on our loved ones. Being locked in a room by yourself for 23 hours for longer than 15 days is honestly ludicrous. The lack of food, sunlight, and human communication are just a few of the things they endured during that time. Not only does it take a toll on him, but it takes a toll on us, the families. Did, did they eat today? Did he get out, of the, get out for a shower today? Did he get some fresh air and enjoy the sunlight today? Did he get out and stretch his legs instead of being in a dark room by himself with nothing but his thoughts? Worrying for his well-being, that's mo what I'm most concerned about for our loved ones. PTSD is a real thing. My father is a retired Navy SEAL who served our country in Vietnam. My dad often explains to me that it's like what it's like to be in solitary confinement and the PTSD caused from it. Because let's face it, I'll never really understand it, but my father does. And he, he feels so sorry for our loved ones who have to endure any of this. His mental state is not well. I can hear it in his voice when I do get the calls. Everyone needs human interaction and to take that away blows my mind. The state is always talking about how they want to reform. How is this going to make things better? This is making things worse. It's like they're, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please, we have to do better. I'm in full support of this bill, um, SB 307, and reduce the number of days people can be held in solitary. Thank you.
All right. I don't see anybody else coming to the table in Carson City or Las Vegas to give um, support testimony. We are going to go to the phones. I also want to let you all know that we're coordinating with our staff down in the Grant Sawyer building right now to make sure that we can continue to keep a room open for this hearing. Um, and I will have an update for you when we are done with phone support testimony. So we'll go to the, to the phones now for testimony support of SB 307. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support of SB 307, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. This is Holly Wellborn speaking today as someone whose family member died in, iso in an isolation unit and is a longtime advocate for solitary reform in Nevada. I thank Senator Spearman for her tireless leadership and for stepping up when no one else would. Of his time in prison, Nelson Mandela said that solitary confinement is the most forbidding aspect of prison life. There was no end and no beginning. There's only one's mind, which can begin to play tricks. <laughs> for decades, prison officials insisted that solitary confinement did not exist in the Nevada Department of Corrections. In 2017, I co-authored a report entitled Unlocking Solitary Confinement, which blew the lid on, the, on Nevada's use of extreme isolation. The report tells the stories of hundreds of men and women who lived in solitary conditions without any meaningful human interaction for weeks, years, and even decades. This issue is fully vetted. The ACLU, the Vera Institute for Justice, the Nevada Disability Advocacy and Law Center, the Unlock the Box campaign, Solitary Watch, all agree that Nevada's use of isolation is inhumane. The vast majority of people in isolation units and NDOC will be released to the community. This practice harms not only the solitary survivors who struggle to succeed on the outside, but as a community as a whole. We developed a family of survivors and advocates and built a movement for change. Our efforts and new leadership at the NDOC are why you have this bill before you today. I urge the committee to move this bill through and to do it swiftly. Thank you. This is Aisha Goins, A-E-S-H-A-G-O-I-N-S, -S, on behalf of the NAACP Las Vegas, Nevada. The stories we just heard from the impacted people, I just want to yield my time to that and make sure that we are listening and we are hearing because I felt that as they were speaking. And I want to just say that we support this bill. I appreciate Senator Spearman for bringing this bill. I appreciate the work that ACLU and Nick Sheepak have done on this bill that seeks to, pr to promote fair and humane treatment in our offenders. Um, we support this bill and thank you. Um, hello, my name is Yesenia Moya, Y-E-S-E-N-I-A-M-O-Y-A. I am here in support of this bill because, as many folks have mentioned already, solitary confinement is inhumane. So reducing the amount of days that somebody can be held is a good step in the right direction. Um, many of my friends and community members have been held in solitary confinement. One of them was held up to a year and one month. Um, and for a, while he was awaiting a charge, that was not true. Um, I am going to be reading a, a letter from Marcus Kelly. In bringing us a step closer to the ultimate goal of seeing the whole person as a human being worthy of human, humane treatment, I refer to a very impactful preliminary but sweeping remedial order issued by the U.S. District Judge Rosalind O. Silver, State of Arizona telling state officials what they must do to bring standards up to constitutional muster and that the state will not weasel out of its constitutional obligations this time. 
offering a 15 day trial in November and December 2021, which included evidence and testimony. The honorable judge concluded that the Arizona Department of Corrections Rehabilitation and Reentry systematically violated the Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment by having a grossly inadequate medical and mental health care system and by depriving people in solitary confinement of basic human needs, including adequate nutrition, exercise, and social interaction. See Jensen versus Shin. Although we still see have a long way to go, this bill is a start to recognizing that incarceration does not make you less of a person and therefore not worthy or deserving of inhumane treatment. Rehabilitation begins with mental health care and this bill recognizes that need. I am therefore in full support of this bill. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman and members of the committee. Will Pregman testifying on behalf of Battleborn Progress. We are in support of the bill. Simply uh, say ditto and submit comments in writing. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon to the members of the committee and thank you to Senator Spearman for bringing this forward. My name is uh, Mark Bencourt for the record, uh, here on behalf of the Nevada Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Uh, in the interest of time for this hardworking committee, I will just echo the comments of all the other folks in support today um, and thank uh, those survivors for sharing their stories today um, and, and humbly urge you all to support this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Pramila Dixit Nag, and I would like to thank Senator Pat Spearman for introducing this very important human rights bill, Senate Bill SB 307. And I would also, uh, I have submitted a letter, so I'm not going to read all of it out. It's fairly long, but I, I would like to read a part of it um, uh, that. Uh, it, it, it is in the American spirit to undo solitary confinement and all of its abuse, and uh, it, it is really torture, uh, because the Mandela rule that might go into effect with SB 307 uh, was in part written by uh, a Colorado Department of Corrections director, Rick Ram uh, Ramesh, who assisted the U.S. delegation to the U.N. meeting in Cape Town and Vienna to rewrite prisoner care standards, which are known as the Mandela Rules, and the American Law Institute endowed the world with the original human rights law draft in the 1940s. So it is quintessentially American to undo this horrific torture that goes on in American prisons uh, uh, North Dakota uh, wrote a paper, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in Volume 9, 2021, Health and Human Justice. I, I urge the uh, uh, legislators to please read this. It's called, We Just Needed to Open the Door, a Case Study of the Quest to End Solitary Confinement in North Dakota. Uh, it notes that in 2012, a prison expansion nearly doubled the number of long-term solitary confinement cells at NDSP and the median length of stay in solitary confinement increased from 109 to 136.5 days by the end of 2013. A warden noted that it was like the old adage, if you build it, they will come. Incarcerated people and staff said that the expansion led to a sharp, punitive turn in the culture, violence and unrest increased, there were crazy fights and chaos all the time. There used to be 
stuff happening every single day. There was group tension, actual hatred. Many staff and incarcerated persons interviewed about this period said that uh, the solitary confinement units were dehumanizing, volatile, and traumatizing. Uh, a North Dakota psychologist said for years and years and years, there was just a ton of trauma in that unit. We had many people who tried to kill themselves, a lot of self-harm, a lot of staff injuries, some very, very major and serious assaults on staff that left, left people very disabled, and just a lot of consistent crises. One SAU clinician noted that there was lots of infighting, lots of blaming other people for things going wrong, lots of distrust between staff. There were lots of reactive decision-making, avoidance, and all kinds of other things that happen when you're just saturated in chronic toxic stress. Another psychologist remembered working conditions in the SAU as being just eating up people alive and causing burnout and turnover among cl clinicians and security staff. This demands urgent change. Uh, North Dakota made this change uh, with a men following a visit to the Norwegian Correctional Services and incorporating their philosophy, policies, and practices in 2015. The changes that they inst uh, instated right after that visit resulted in 74.28% reduction in the use of solitary confinement between 2016 and 2020. I think Nevada has been set a very good example by a group of Western states that are beginning to do the right thing. And I urge Nevada legislators to please read my letter. You have received uh, incredibly powerful, uh, heart-wrenching uh, testimony from all the people we've heard today. I beg you, please, uh, with a complete unanimity pass uh, SB 307, and thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Honorable members of the Judiciary Senate. This is Mercedes Maharis, Nevada chaplain and member of Senate District 3 Silver-Haired Legislative Forum. Um, please view my film, The Whole, that includes former NDOC employees who worked in solitary. Unfortunately, I see no sanctions against NDOC officials in SB 307 who do not enforce law library access. We've had many reports about not being able to get law library access while in solitary confinement. And what about mental and physical health care in solitary? Much neglected based on our reports, and there is a federal lawsuit in process right now about that in solitary confinement. I am happy that this has come back again. Um, I've watched this bill go through, and in closing, I support this, but please add oversight for this vulnerable population. I beg you to do so. Otherwise, this culture is not going to shift, in my opinion, after decades of observation. And in closing, this good dream of ending physical and mental assaults on human beings will only remain a nightmare unless you add enforcement to end this human terror and horror. Please add these issues of making NDOC follow their own rules. Peace for all human beings. I remain Mercedes Harris.
Hello, my name is Jovan Jackson. I am a North Las Vegas resident. Uh, I am in support of this bill. I would like to say uh, solitude is not rehabilitation. And uh, often we think solitude as a tool of punishment, but it is used from the jailhouses to the prisons just as a, a way of living. Most jailhouses are on 23 hour lockdown. Uh, these are folks that are having been found guilty of anything. And then your intake into prison, uh, if anyone been to prison or worked in the prison, you know something called the fish tank. You, your beginning process of um, being in prison comes with solitude. Uh, so I am a supporter of this bill, and thank you. Anne Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T, calling in support of SB 416. I want to thank the sponsor, Senator Spamman, and I want to apologize to all those who have had the torturous practice of solitary confinement perpetuated against them by the state of Nevada. Nobody can give this committee better insight into why this bill should pass. Solitary confinement is inhumane, and we must do better. Please support this bill. Hello, my name is Amelia Booth, and I'm just in support of the bill. I have, don't have anything to say that hasn't already been expressed very eloquently. Thank you. Tanya Brown. T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. We strongly support SB 307. Uh, we'd like to echo the previous comments made, and we'd like to include something else. And that is, um, I, along with other advocates, and, and even the current ones now, but going back, we're going back decades, where we have actually witnessed retaliatory behavior caused by NDOC staff against some of these inmates, and then how they would get thrown into the hole for whatever reason, if they didn't like them, it didn't matter. And it wear, it would wear them down so much so that I have received um, calls, we're talking 20 years ago, 25 years ago, calls from inmates and letters about a certain inmate who was losing it. And they kept throwing him back into the hole and he just couldn't take it anymore. And then he said he was gonna, he was gonna get thrown into the hole again. And he said, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it, I'm not going back. I would receive a letter from another inmate. True to his word, he never went back. He killed himself. We strongly support this bill. Thank you. That concludes callers testifying in support. All right, thank you. Uh, just so everybody knows, it, it looks like we did lose our feed down to Las Vegas, um, but as always, anybody who is in the room in Las Vegas has access to the um, agenda, which has a phone number on it so they can call in to, to still give their testimony. And um, by the same token, we are going to move the presentation or the hearing on SB 416 from today to Friday. Uh, the 14th. Um, I did talk to my co-presenters about that. So um, I apologize for any inconvenience, but appreciate you all being invested in this process on all of these important bills. And with that, I will continue with the testimony. I've not forgotten that we're in the middle of testimony on SB 307, and we will go to testimony in opposition. Anybody wishing to give opposition testimony here in Carson City is invited to the front now but I don't see anybody. So we'll go to the phones for testimony in opposition to SB 307. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 307, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no cause to testify in opposition. 
All right, then we'll go to testimony in neutral. Come on up to the front if you're here to testify in neutral. Hello, this is James Arenda. I'm the director for the Nevada Department of Corrections. Uh, first of all, I've been uh, working with uh, or discussing with uh, Senator Spearman since 2017 on corrections of these solitary confinement uh, uh, rules and regulations that we have. Um, I do applaud her ethical treatment, passion for the offenders, for staff, and those also that are um, being affected in the community from this. Um, just so it's uh, clear, uh, in 2015, I was personally present in the United Nations testifying uh, in, on behalf of the ASCA, Association of State Correctional Administrators, when you're discussing about uh, uh, solitary confinement. I did read the testimony that before Nelson Mandela's death in 2013 that he provided saying that uh, solitary, conf he wasn't saying solitary confinement was not necessary. He said long-term solitary confinement is detrimental to men uh, the mental health and well-being of those, uh, those that, that are affected. Um, with this, uh, the amendments, I do believe we will have better amendments uh, that we we're both can agree upon uh, for a work session. Um, the issues that I have is that there has to be some type of a carve out for inpatient mental health and medical. I mean, if you're falling, uh, considering solitary confinement 22 or more hours a day inside a cell, um, you're going to see um, those that are inpatient medical that are on respirators or whatever, you're, we're not going to force those individuals out of the cell. So there has to be some carve out with medical mental health. Also, there has to be some type of a carve out for those that clinical is notifying custody that the individual that's in solitary confinement uh, upon their 15th day is in a homicidal state. Again, we don't want to take those individuals out, but there has to be a process for that with clinical review uh, in that interdisciplinary uh, review that involves the custody, the, the caseworker, and the corrections uh, uh, officers to determine what uh, process you have to take or what do we need to do to get these individuals out. Um, I don't want to see the agency forcing individuals out, especially if they have individuals that are refusing to be around anybody. There's a reason behind it. Um, could be clinical or it could be even something that could be gang related. Someone that's in fear of their life, uh, killed another gang member on the street, knows that if he steps foot into population around anybody, they will kill him. There, there are situations that happen like that and they're not hypothetical. Um, but there has to be something around there that there's a plan for them, treatment plan. We can't force individuals out of segregation for certain circumstances. So in the whole, uh, I do believe this is the right way we're going. Um, however, there's certain uh, pieces of it that need to be carved out in, uh, in an amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, I think we might have some questions for you, starting with Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Zarenda, for being here, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Spearman, for working on this issue for so many years, and the testimony today, uh, a lot of it was very disturbing. So, um, Mr. Zarenda, I just want to ask you a few questions. What, what is the maximum days in a row that a prisoner within the prison system of Nevada can remain in solitary confinement? James Renner, for the record, so right now in disciplinary segregation is 30 days. 30 days straight, but they- For they, sanctions. But they can be, re they're supposed to be removed for an hour each day for showering or bathing, or are they 100% there 24 hours a day, 30, 30 days straight? James Renner, for the record, no, they're let out every single day, just their status of uh, being on segregation uh, is only for sanctions up to 30 days. And th what, is your, what is the responsibility of your staff to observe them throughout the day? So what the staff do is, is they're required to tour uh, every 15 minutes. Um, they have to tour, which basically is a site observation of every individual. Um, right now, there's no uh, medical and mental health uh, mandatory tour, which I think there should be um, of those in segregation. Um, so every, so you're going in a 24-hour period every 15 minutes. Somebody has to be touring inside a disciplinary segregation to put in their eye on some individual that's in there. Okay, and the officer, officers that oversee uh, this area of the prison, are they specially trained beyond which a normal prison guard would be trained? 
So James Arenda, for the record, not in the training that you are mentioning. There should be a specific training for restrictive housing, solitary confinement training. There's, there, there's training on it, but it's not specific to uh, you know, what we should be doing, not doing based upon uh, ethical treatments and all that. It should be refined. In all the uh, prisons that we have that have solitary confinement cells, do you staff psychologists, social workers, and physicians and nurses? James Renner, for the record, no. Um, we have agency uh, facilities that do not have 24-7 uh, or even five-day-a-week psychologists or psychiatrists like Ely. Um, there are avenues to be able to do this even on an interdisciplinary team with video or doing long distance, but we don't have the staff that are actually in those facilities to do uh, full person in-person compliance. So it would be fair to say that if this bill was to be passed in its present form, you would have to hire a psychologist and a social worker um, in each of your facilities that has solitary confinement. So James Render, for the record, first of all, we don't have any social workers in the agency. There's none. Uh, we have case workers, um, which is a different classification. Uh, for interdisciplinary teams, like I said, it does not have, we don't need to rehire or add additional if they could be done by video um, or uh, phone or some other observation. But if it's in person, you would have to hire. Okay. And uh, do the inmates that are in solitary confinement, do you deliver mail to them every day and can they have uh, telephone privileges? James Renda, for the record, they do get mail every day still, um, just they don't get phone every day. Uh, phone is restricted for certain times during the week, but they do still get phones unless they're in loss of phones because there was something threatening over the phone or they threatened victims. They could be restricted from phones, but they do get mail every day and they are access to uh, phones, but not every day. Okay. And then just to separate myth from reality for me and for people that are listening, uh, in Alcatraz, they had a D block, which was dedicated for uh, confinement. Uh, and then they had what was called the hole, right, which was a subset of block D that inmates were stripped and they were placed in a solid concrete square. Can you tell me uh, what is our solitary confinement cells like? Are there different types of solitary confinement cells that we use? And uh, can you give us the reality of that? James Arenda, for the record, so I'm just going on our solitary confinement, as in this, this language, is anyone locked down 22 or more hours a day. It's different from what you've been seeing in the movies, what solitary confinement is. Uh, individuals that are on uh, solitary confinement or segregation status in the state, uh, they're fully clothed. They do have certain property privileges. They do get mail. Um, they do have access to turn their lights on and off. Um, so it's, uh, it's different from uh, what you've been seeing in the movies, but uh, they, they do have access to all that. It's not the same as what you saw in, in Alcatraz. Do they have access of their counsel if their counsel demands to see them while they're in solitary confinement? James Render, for the record, yes, but it's very limited time frames. Um, it's the, we don't have full access to staff to be able to do that, but they do. They can still s uh, send what we call kites. They have emergencies. They still have access to medical mental health, and uh, with the caseworkers, they do. But it's uh, it's it's not every single uh, shift. I appreciate your your concerns for the carve outs, and I hope that you'll continue to work diligently with Senator Spearman. I don't think any of us uh, on this committee want to see people tortured, we want to see people uh, punished to such a degree that it causes them mental illness and more problems. Um, because I, for one, would like to support this legislation, but I also need codification from you that what we are going to pass is manageable and ethical and fair and healthy. So I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you. I share my colleague's appreciation for you uh, coming down here today and, and answering our questions and testifying. Um, are there any other questions? All right, I don't see any other questions. Um, is there anybody else here to testify in neutral? If not, we will go to the phone for neutral testimony on SB 307. I'd like to testify in neutral for SB 307. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers testifying in neutral at this time. All right, then that brings us to the conclusion of testimony, and I'll invite the sponsors back up for uh, any closing remarks.
<clears throat> so thank you. Um, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee, um, it was really tough to hear. And <clears throat> even more uncomfortable uh, when you think that some of that could have been, should have been avoided. Um, this bill, although not perfect, uh, continues something you heard um, Director Zrenda say. I started this in 2017. I think it was Senate Bill 402 uh, because one of the things that was happening is um, juveniles were being incarcerated. How about that? Juveniles were being incarcerated and in some instances they were also given psychotropic drugs without the uh, permission um, or uh, a doctor even knowing. Um, I had an opportunity to talk with several of the, <clears throat> the women who were uh, part of Coming Back Strong. Is that right? Return Strong. Return Strong. Return strong. Um, and what they had to say was um, inhumane. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Shepak and Lo if they have something to um, add, and then I'll just close out. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, committee members, and thank you for hearing this today. Um, hoping we don't have to come back um, session after session and, and hear these stories. Uh, there's a few things I want, I want to make abundantly clear. We talk to thousands of individuals um, who are currently or were, cur were recently incarcerated in Nevada, and while it's true that a disciplinary sanction is a 30-day max violation, as you've heard and as we continue to hear, people will sit in solitary confinement while waiting for their disciplinary hearing. People will get one sanction followed by another sanction followed by another, extending that 30-day time period uh, in times indefinitely. Frank De Palma may have been let out in 2014 from solitary, but for the 20 two years and 36 days prior to that, he was held in solitary confinement in the Nevada Department of Corrections. This bill, with its definition as anything over 22 hours a day and a 15-day cap, would ensure that we do not have people in this <coughs> prolonged solitary confinement. Um, we're in talks with the director. I think there's a, f a few changes we need to make that we can all come to an agreement upon and we can get you something for work session uh, that will have the support of everyone. But, but this needs to be done. I, I see myself moving forward in many different directions and, and me leaving certain issues behind to go after different ones, but solitary confinement is something I will work on until the day that I die. The people that I have met who have survived solitary confinement are the most inspirational people I've ever met in my life, and it is my goal to make sure that nobody else has to meet one of them in the future. Thank you. Thank you, um, Lilith Green, for the record. I echo um, Nick's sentiments also, and I want to um, just correct that we, we – we call it a Department of Corrections, not a Department of Punishment. We do not send people there to be punished. We're sending them there to correct behaviors so that they can become citizens of our society to help us all grow together. And in the Netherlands, um, they have ended solitary, and they, they have a different kind of saying, and it is that you send people to court to be punished and you send them to prison to become a better citizen. And that is what the goal should be for all of these criminal justice bills is to rehabilitate behavior. These people missed something along the way and need to be retaught how society works. And we need to, if we're calling something corrective, actually use it in a corrective manner. And I think we can all agree that this um, prolonged torture is, is not helpful for anyone. Um, so I just I want to thank everyone for the time that they took today, and I think that it would behoove all of us to take a field trip um, to both you know death row and in solitary unit because I think that we all really need to have a picture of what we're talking about when we're um, hearing these stories. We need to honor these stories with physical action, and I think it it can happen outside of this building as well. So I think for myself and for all of us that we should plan a little trip. Thank you. Thank you, and Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say I know that sometimes when 
when we deal with um, matters such as this in the criminal justice system, um, there's a tendency for some to say you're being soft on crime, uh, which is not the case. Um, and there may be some after this, and hopefully we can get to a place where we can, this uh, measure can be passed and implemented. Um, and so I may be accused of being a wild-eyed liberal, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but I'm probably in good company. I, I, a lot of other people read to you uh, letters, and so I want to read to you just a portion of a letter uh, from my mentor. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And that was a letter that was left to me and to anyone else who follows the carpenter's son. And it's not just about punishment, it's also about grace and mercy. And when you mix those two together, that's when you come up with a humane way to correct behavior of people that may have lost something along the way. I read to you from part of a letter left to me by, from my mentor, and I commend all of you to that. It's Luke 23, 42. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this bill presentation, for sticking with us through um, all of the, the questions and all of the testimony uh, so that everybody knows it is my intent to uh, put this on the work session for tomorrow. Um, I understand there may be some additional amendments for us to review, and hopefully we can all get that done in a little less than 24 hours. Um, and otherwise, there's still Friday, guys. We, we have until Friday. So uh, with that, I will officially close the hearing on SB 307. I will go to the last... Since we're moving SB 416, in case anybody missed that, moving that to Friday, um, I will move to the last item on our agenda, which is public comment. Anybody wishing to give public comment is invited to the front of the room uh, now and go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. My name is Nick Sheepak. I just wanted to throw on the record that I have the Marlins at 101 to win the World Series, just in case you know, pop swap. Excellent use of public comment, period. Um, and let's see if there's anybody on the phone to give public comment. If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Tanya Brown. T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-M, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. On February 22nd, Assembly Bill 49 was heard, and then last Friday uh, the work session was done, completed, and it didn't pass. But during the uh, initial hearing, um, the chair would not um, allow um, our proposed amendment, which was to establish a factual innocence uh, posthumous uh, petition to be heard, uh, the um, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod asked the AG's office um, about our amendment dealing with posthumous, and if they had supported it, um, their answer was they would not support it, they wouldn't consider it, they don't want to change the intent of the language and or alter or change the process. So um, we are asking that you um, accept our proposed amendment and we'd also like to uh, read something and this is from um, this is from a fellow exoneree he was the hundredth person to be exonerated by a DNA although he was not convicted in Nevada it was Nevada State Senator Ray Rawson whose testimony as an expert in bite marks got him convicted where Mr. Carone received the death penalty the first time and life without. So I will just read a small portion of what Mr. Carone would like for you to know. He states, I don't ask you to imagine what those 10 years in prison were like for me. I want you to imagine what it would be for you if it was your son or daughter serving that time for a crime they didn't commit. At what point would you stop fighting to clear their name? How many times would they have to tell you, I didn't do it? Had I died, in prison, not only would my family and friends have been denied justice, but the family of Kim and Kona would have been denied as well. 
please support factual innocence, cases being allowed to proceed to conclusion, even if the person of the crime has died. And I would like for you to consider that and also consider what um, the testimony given during 2019 um, from those who've been wrongfully convicted, more so Mr. DeMarlo Berry. And I was given the opportunity and honor to, uh, honor to speak with him after the hearing. And I asked him specifically if he, if things had not turned out the way they did and he had died prior to being exonerated, would he want his family to continue on to clear his name? And he said, absolutely. You ask any person who has been exonerated. And if they had not been exonerated and died before their exoneration, they still want their names cleared. We asked that. The, uh, the uh, Senate Judiciary sponsor our proposed amendment to Assembly Bill 49. If you can't do this committee, would at least one of you please sponsor the bill? Thank you. Anne Marie Grant, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. I want to talk about AB 49 and would ask that you review our proposed amendments adding posthumous exoneration language to the bill. And I ask for you to support AB 49 with our amendments. The AG's office testified that we don't need posthumous language because it changes the process. And that's interesting because truth be told, there are no other remedies for those who have died wrongfully convicted in prison in the state of Nevada currently available. Besides this legislature passing AB 49 with our amendment to add the posthumous language, the AG's attempt may to be to clean up the language of the bill, but a lot of the bills start off with that intent, and we add to them to strengthen them to protect all Nevadans. <clears throat> what if someone you represented died in prison and you find exculpatory evidence after their death? Would you tell the family, so what, he's dead, it doesn't matter? I urge you to use it as an opportunity to fix these injustices. There must be a mechanism to correct the ultimate injustice of dying wrongfully convicted in prison. You are now given this opportunity to correct the injustice so that in the future you will never have to tell a family that. This is between you and your conscience. Would we have said, oh well, if Damalo Barry died in prison, Kathy Wood, Fred Steve, Kirsten Lobato, and the others who we know were wrongfully convicted in Nevada? You can set the legacy for yourself that you did the right thing. Please give the families of those who have been wrongfully convicted and died in prison a chance at justice and closure. Thank you. That concludes all callers for public comment. All right, then that brings us to the end of our meeting today. Um, I think we're scheduled for 1 p.m. tomorrow because we do have floor, um, as always, subject to change. But we look forward to seeing you tomorrow sometime. And until then, we are adjourned. <laughs>